the process and before getting started, I would like to make a few uh, comments on the organization uh, of the preparatory process. We uh, took the working group uh, on IGF improvement very seriously, as you may recall or may not, there was when it came to the renewal of the mandate of the IGF, it was decided to set up a working group to discuss possible improvements for the IGF, and one improvement they suggested was that each session should focus on two or three policy questions. And those who organized this workshop, Henriette, to name her and give her the honor, she came up with some of questions herself, but we also asked for community input, and what we received from the community, these questions are now available on our website, and the Secretariat will put them up on our screen, but you can look at them on your computer. It does not mean that this session is expected to uh, answer all of these questions, but nevertheless we think they provide a useful input into the discussions. And another related announcement, many of the questions you will discuss here this afternoon will be revisited tomorrow morning. We have a session from 9.30 till 12.30 on Internet surveillance, and there we also have questions. Uh, this was under emerging issues, and we decided this week to extend the sessions to leave more, leave more room for discussion, as this is an issue uh, participants are very interested in. So with that, I hand over to the chair of this session, Mr. Moidorno, who is also a member of the multi-stakeholder advisory group. Mr. Moidorno, please. Thank you, Mr. Marcus. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we will now uh, resume our meeting. Uh, I open this afternoon's focus session on openness Human Rights, Freedom of Expression, and Free Flow of Information on the Internet. Uh, I'm right now here uh, to replace uh, Ms. Professor Dr. Harkisutri Askesnovo, the Director General of uh, Human Rights, Ministry of Law and Human Rights, because of uh, he, she has to go to the Parliament, so he asked me to uh, replace as Chairman here. Yeah. I'm looking forward to our discussion about these important issues. This session will offer a multi-stakeholder overview of the current status of human rights, freedom of expression, and free flow of information on the Internet. Our interactive discussion will touch upon many of the key issues that have been held in related workshops prior to this session and will give all stakeholders an equal platform to address issues related to human rights and the Internet to find points of consensus, points of convergence, and points of further to other institutions or actors, if appropriate. <coughs> uh, later, our speakers would contribute their experience and expertise with regard to the set issue, and I am convinced that all of us would be able to learn a lot from each other with regard to this issue. I believe all of us here start from the same platform, i.e. recognizing that the existence of the Internet has greatly affected the life of all people regardless of age, nationality, gender, social status, etc. Indeed, it is an unprecedented revolution in technology bringing out a very significant influence to our daily life. Our lifestyle, the business world, including the government services to its people. Naturally, such advancement in technology also has some impact on the issue of human rights in particular, the issue of freedom of expression. Briefly, Internet has become a more and more important tool in the world not only to fulfill all human rights, but also to do away with injustices to accelerate the development and promotion of human's quality of life. Hence, the issue of human rights become prominent in this session. From the international human rights perspective, it is suffice to say that 
this freedom of information, freedom of expression, mainly stems from Article 19, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which all of you have certainly learned it by heart. To strengthen it, there are also stipulation of this freedom, which is found in many international human rights instruments, such as the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, Convention on the Rights of the Child, and International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination. For your information, Indonesia has ratified or acceded to all the above human rights instruments. These human rights instruments are continuously developed into various international and regional instruments ensuring freedom of expression. Having about 240 million population, Indonesia is an archipelagic country that has also more than uh, 15,000 uh, islands, has been placed as the eighth biggest internet user in the world and the fourth in Asia. Asosiasi Pengelenggara Jasa Indonesia, that is uh, Indonesian Internet Service Provider Association, reported that at the end of 2012, the number of internet users in Indonesia reached 63 million, an increase of 14.3% compared to 2011, and increased 1.26% compared to 1998 rate. In addition, our data reveal that Indonesian Internet users are also avid users of other social media such as blog, Facebook, Twitter, etc. With more than 50 million Facebook users, more than 20 million active Twitter accounts, and more than 5 million blogs, Indonesia is certainly a fertile land of blossoming freedom of information. With such status, understandably, Indonesia is very concerned with the issue of Internet and freedom of expression. This is reflected in the incorporation of freedom of action in our Constitution, in particular through the Second Amendment in 2001. Article 28E of the Constitution stipulates freedom of expression as one of the rights to which everybody is entitled to while Article 28F asserts everyone's right to communicate and to obtain information for the development of oneself and social environment and find, receive, secure, manage and impart information by using all accessible media as an embodiment of the aspirations of all people in Indonesia the constitution serves as the law of the land that must be obeyed by all Hence, these stipulations are followed up by a number of laws and regulations to ensure freedom of, of expression and information. Uh, nonetheless, I would not mislead you all to think that all is wine and roses in my country. Similar to other countries, we do have challenges in the implementation of such stipulations ranging from the any law enforcement officers to the misperception of some groups in our heterogeneous society who misconstrues freedom of expression as an absolute protection for everybody to say anything regardless of its legal consequences and damages incurred. Capacity building, awareness raising and public education then constitute important measures that Indonesia continuously strive for. As an important pillar to our full-fledged democracy, rights to information also has also been reflected in our increasing use of virtual media for government services so that the people have access to all kinds of information with regard to public services. The transformation, of course, takes time, and a government regime is continuously developed to ensure the implementation of good governance principles. As part of public accountability measure, all government unit is obliged to develop its website with real-time data to provide information and services to the public. Regretfully, according to Global Irrigenous Ranking published by the United Nations in 2010, Indonesia's rank is a little below the world average 
i.e. number 109 out of 193 countries. Acknowledging this predicament, our government has been accelerating its effort to improve the condition. As a result of this effort, the 2012 report on global irrigation ranking put Indonesia at the 97th place. A slight but quite promising increase. Furthermore, our law on freedom of information is adapted to further serve the stipulation in the Constitution, in particular to enhance efficiency, effectiveness, transparency, accountability, and access to the public services. Finally, ladies and gentlemen, it is my greatest hope that our interaction today would contribute to the betterment of our global society for the full enjoyment of human rights, in particular freedom of expression. In this discussion, uh, I think also we uh, have to uh, show concerning the Tunis Angela for Informal Society in 2005, uh, internal, internal government part, point 42 and point 42 that uh, express also the freedom of rights and also human rights. Now I would like to introduce a moderator to, uh, for this event, for this session. First, Ms. Anja Kovac, on my left, Internet Democracy Project, and Mr. Johan Hellenborg, Ministry, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Stockholm, supported by Andriat S2 Heisen ABC. Next, I would like to uh, turn this session to uh, moderators. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mujiono. I'm going to briefly stand. I know uh, this room is very, very big. We've tried to make the format a little bit more interactive. I hope uh, it's okay. I would really like to encourage people who are sitting in the back to move more to the front. There's still lots of seats this side as well. We there actually are espresso machines under the seats back here. So anybody who moves to here, you'll find a fired up espresso machine under your seat. We, really, we realize that you might want to uh, move out of the session in between. It's a long session. That's okay. We still think it's better if you sit a little closer to the stage. Um, so my name is uh, Anya Kovac. I work with the Internet Democracy Project in uh, India and will be moderating together with Johan Hallenborg from the Swedish government and supported by Henriette from APC. Uh, we also have Joy Lidikot from APC, who is our rapporteur and Carl Fredrik Wettermark from the Swedish government who will be keeping an eye on the Twitter stream for us. Uh, so you're welcome to encourage people to tweet. Um, at the remote participation uh, is sitting that side and we're very grateful for their support as well. Um, I'm very happy to welcome you here today at what I think is a historic session. For eight long years, I think uh, a lot of people have worked very hard to get a focus session for human rights at the IGF, and this is the first year that this finally happened. We've seen some important landmark events happening in the past few years. I think uh, the resolutions on uh, online freedom and offline freedom should be the same at the Human Rights Council are one example of uh, such an achievement. We've also seen many challenges, and I think in the past year it's especially surveillance that has really come onto the agenda. It will no doubt cast its shadow over this session. Uh, we do also want to deal with it, but as Mark has already pointed out, there is a focus session on surveillance tomorrow as well. And we think there are many other really important human rights issues that we do still need to address as well. So we want to maintain that balance, and I hope that's okay with everybody. Just very briefly, the rules of the game. We have a fairly long list of people who have been asked beforehand to speak. Um, could those people perhaps raise their hands? Can all of you just, I can see there's some people back there in the audience. Can you just make sure that you're at least close to a microphone? And if not, please move so that you are. Thank you. Despite having a, a, a number of pre-designated speakers, we want to make this as interactive as possible. 
Uh, for that reason, we ask you not to exceed three minutes in your intervention. And Riette is going to help us with timekeeping. We will send, give you a yellow card when you've reached the time limit and a red card when we are going to cut you off within 10 seconds. That's really harsh, but because this is an important session, we really feel it's important to get many perspectives out. You're also encouraged, apart from making your points briefly but strongly, to engage as much as possible with others. And though there have been a lot of pre-designated people asked to speak, we will try and make this as interactive as possible. Um, finally, just for Twitter, the hashtag is uh, #hashhr as well as IGF2013. I think uh, that was all that we needed to say by way of introduction for now. Let's start with the session. Thank you very much, Anja. My name is Johan Hallenborg. I work uh, with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Sweden, in Stockholm, at the Department of International Law and Human Rights. And I work on, on uh, human rights issues in relation to the Internet and our Internet Freedom Program. Um, we will kick off this session by having uh, some input from, from the regional perspective, the regional uh, developments over the last year. Um, we are kindly asking uh, for some highlights from the respective six regional rapporteurs uh, in relation to the enjoyment of human rights online. Um, we would like to ask you for th three main issues, be, be, be they good or bad, challenges or success stories. So you, it, it's a pretty easy, a pretty easy um, outline. It's three topics, three things, and you have three minutes. So uh, let's kick off and see where, where, this, where this ends. So let's start with uh, Jokai Benavi from Access. Um, the floor is yours, Jokai. Okay. It's always hard to be the first person to speak. I'm not quite sure what to do. Closer, so, closer to the mic, um, please. Hi there. My name is Jokai Benavi. I'm the policy director at Access, accessnow.org. Um, we're an international NGO that defends and extends the rights of uh, users at risk around the world. Um, I'm going to try and summarize. There's a lot to say about what's going on in the United States right now, um, and I think we're all very familiar with um, the revelations and scandals that have come out this summer. Um, as much as it's been scary, if not terrifying, to learn about the, the gross invasions of um, user privacy, of, uh, of due process, and the extent to which um, the NSA, uh, the, Brit the UK's GCHQ and other um, intelligence agencies have invaded the network. Um, I, I do think that we are starting to see um, some progress within the U.S. context. Um, the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board has um, actually been uh, formalized. It has a full board, um, has actually gotten funding recently, um, and they did a call for comment. Um, Best Bits, a network of human rights organizations that has been meeting here uh, in Bali and elsewhere has been working on this and sent a letter um, that really stressed that, that protections need to be extended not just from, to U.S. citizens but to international users as well. And I think that's been really crucially missing um, in many parts of this debate within the U.S. context. Um, at the same time, I would say that what we're hearing from our, from our colleagues who work in Washington is that international pressure um, from, from folks outside the United States is really um, having a difference, um, particularly on um, the companies, um, the U.S. companies that are holding most of this data. Um, the companies have joined with uh, many of the large Internet platforms, I should say, um, Google, Facebook, Yahoo, and so forth, um, Microsoft, have joined with a number of civil society organizations, with investors, with trade associations in the We Need to Know Coalition um, to push for greater transparency um, around um, requests for access to user data. Um, and, and I think with that, we're also seeing some legislative movement in the United States. Um, transparency, again, being a big focus. Um, in terms of substantive reform, there are a few bills, but I think the one that's most likely to move um, has, uh, has yet to be introduced. That's the Lay Conyers and Sensor Bender bill that would end bulk collection um, for telcos and internet metadata under PRISM and other programs. Um, I really think that we're in a crucial moment in the United States and that the more that we can keep the pressure on um, here and moving forward, um, the better, and this is really the moment for action. Thank you. That was very short and to the point. Thank you so much. Let's move to Asia, and uh, let's hear from Gayatri 
uh, you are executive director of uh, SIAPA, right? The floor is yours. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I represent a regional network of media freedom advocacy groups. Um, so in relation to the issue, I would like to share two things that I think are quite uh, uh, developments of concern and two that I think uh, would bring about some positive uh, impact. The first is actually in relation to a recent uh, adoption of the uh, Human Rights Declaration within the ASEAN context. So it's the ASEAN Human Rights Declaration. Um, unfortunately, the, the, the declaration itself falls below minimum standards uh, in reference to international standards. And one of the victims of that um, compromise has been freedom of expression. So Article 23 of the declaration, which talks about freedom of expression, takes everything from Article 19 except the point about across frontiers. So you have freedom of expression but not across frontiers. Uh, at a time when we have already entered digital age, Indonesia is hosting the uh, IGF, ASEAN has adopted a declaration that removes that right. So I think that is of serious concern, um, primarily because uh, in the last few years we have seen great violations uh, of expression online. That is the first one at the regional level. The second is that in countries within the region, there is really a move back towards um, more regressive policies and regulations, particularly because of um, the wide use of online spaces for free expression. So we have seen the, uh, the enactment of legislations that include more criminal defamation and also a lot more content uh, regulation. So instead of actually moving back, it's actually try, uh, moving forward, it's actually uh, moving back. So that's two that I think um, we, we see as policy concerns uh, for Southeast Asia. However, having said that there is this bad legislation coming forward, we have seen civil society in some of the nations actually doing very effective pushback. So, for example, the introduction of the Cybercrime uh, Prevention Act in the Philippines, um, there was a pushback from civil society. So there's actually a temporary restraining order so it, to prevent the uh, implementation of the law. So that's actually been a very, very positive um, uh, action itself, a strategy that maybe the others can also uh, follow suit. Um, the second thing is that um, we have seen also with the growth of the online spaces for news media, one of the issues is ethics, and we have seen a number of media organizations and communities developing self-regulation online. And I think that is a very interesting uh, concurrent development in terms of uh, regulation. So it's not official regulation, but it's self-regulation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gayatri. Thank you very much. We will now turn to um, Eduardo Bertone from Argentina and uh, hear what he has to say. Thank you. The floor is yours. Thank you, Johannes. Johannes. Um, I'm Eduardo Bertone. I'm a law professor in Argentina, and I'm the director of the Center for Studies on Freedom of Expression and Access to Information, CELE, at Palermo University. And you uh, asked about uh, having interaction. There are many, many Latin American colleagues here, so what I'm going to say now could be expanded or, you know, complemented by my fellow colleagues that are here. You asked just three issues and to talk for just three minutes, very complicated for a Latin American guy, but I will try. The three issues, cybercrime laws, uh, online content control with frame under the title, and privacy issues. Cybercrime laws, we are, we experienced during the last year, but to be frank, it doesn't start in 2013. Many countries passing new cybercrime laws, specific cybercrime laws, or reforms of the criminal codes in general that include cybercrimes. Many of those uh, new laws are very vague and not very well drafted, and that could create problems for freedom of expression and privacy. Online content control, the main issue in the region in my, in my view, is intermediary liability, and also some legislation related to cyberbullying or anti-child pornography laws, which is okay, but the problem is that in some situations, the provisions could affect freedom of expression of the people online. We have exam examples of that in Argentina, in terms of intermediary liability. We have all other examples in, in, in Peru, uh, in case of new legislation that have been proposed. And we have the case in Brazil that is not this year where the director of Google was detained 
in a case of intermediary liability. Finally, privacy. Uh, many countries are moving to uh, new data protection laws, uh, and the other thing, the other problem is related to surveillance. Data protection laws are under discussion, as far as I understand, in Chile, Brazil, and other countries, and could be complicated if, not, if they are not very well drafted. And surveillance uh, is still an issue because there are some surveillance systems implemented in, in some countries in Latin America, Ecuador, Brazil, and others, that are or could affect uh, privacy. That's all. Thank you, Eduardo. Very excellent. Uh, we take a jump uh, across to, to Africa and uh, turn to Fatla Adams from the South African Human Rights Commission. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Hi, good afternoon. As mentioned, I'm Fadla Adams from the South African Human Rights Commission, but I'll be speaking to Africa as a whole, as the continent. But before my three minutes formally commence, I just want to throw to the floor, and earlier this week in our day, day zero human rights discussion, we were asked to remember the first time that we engaged online, um, that we assembled or associated online. And that led me to thinking within the African context. And I want you to take a few seconds as I go through the three points uh, on Africa to think about the first time you switched on a light and bam, there was electricity. The first time you opened a tap and water came running out. I'll take it one step further. The first time you flushed a toilet. Now that's what we face in Africa, and I'm not saying it's all doom and gloom, but that's the reality of the African context. So take a moment that whilst we can, many of us remember our first online experience, many people, the most vulnerable, the poorest of the poor that we find in Africa, have never experienced the luxuries that we take for granted, something as basic as flushing a toilet, which is, we have uh, several, several reports speaking to this, even within South Africa surprisingly. But I'll go on and whilst you digest that <laughs> bombshell to speak about the main challenges in Africa and I think that there's been a lot of discussion over the last few days about human rights, about access, about privacy, about security, about freedom of expression and that all finds application within the African context. But we must understand the great disparity within Africa between rich and poor and I think very importantly look at it from a rights-based perspective. And I, I've gotten into debates with the technical people because, yeah, rights and technology, and often it's trying to find that middle road where we both speak the same language. But the question begs is, do we then prioritize in Africa access? Do we prioritize um, security? Do we prioritize including that privacy? Do we prioritize basic services? Or do we use the Internet as a platform to enable those other rights as well. So if you go out into a community and you ask, what would you rather have, internet or would you rather have electricity? Oh, no, electricity. Okay, fine, the internet is a byproduct of that. But then let's have education initiatives running as well. But um, just to get into the three main points before my time is up, uh, access, and in this I mean broadly, both in terms of infrastructure, equipment, access in the narrow sense as well to persons that have disability, older persons, um, vulnerable persons such as women, well, technically I don't like the term vulnerable too much, but let's say those who have been previously uh, or largely discriminated against and unfairly so, um, and also children. And then of course security is a major challenge in Africa and when I speak to this I'm speaking about those countries that are a bit more advanced in terms of the internet technology and access. So there's definitely been um, a high degree of internet freedoms being limited and yellow card legislative developments we've seen on the continent over the last uh, year or two that there's been a um, move for restricting online rights, enabling interception of communications, monitoring, filtering, all of which obstruct uh, free speech. But yeah, two, one last point is that I want to say on the brighter side that in Africa we've developed a telemedicine campaign in East Africa as well as in Southern Africa and um, mobile platform where you can voice your concerns around service delivery, which is quite a big deal in the African sense. Thanks so much. No red card. Phew. Thank you very much. Very good. Um, Lee, are you ready? Um, I'd like to leave the floor to uh, Mr. Lee Hibbard from the Council of Europe uh, to give a few comments on the situation in Europe. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Johan. I think we have to uh, bear in mind when we think about human rights 
in general, closer, uh, in general, is that they grew up 60, over 60 years ago um, uh, because of abuse and, mis- and misuse of people. And so machineries were put in place, declarations and conventions were put in place to try to make sure that that was never the case again. And so I think that my first, um, uh, the, the first contextual point is that we're talking about trust. We're trying to build trust between the government, between authorities, and maybe now companies and people. And so uh, in that context, and everyone says it, the question of uh, surveillance, lawful surveillance, let's, let's be clear in, 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 in many respects, um, and whistleblowers and the thing about human rights defenders or traitor uh, is, is, was a very prevalent discussion in Europe. Um, who is watching the watchers? And uh, do we need more democratic uh, oversight and transparency? Are the laws overly broad? Are they too vague? Can we, can we trust those people who, who conduct surveillance. So that's, that, that trust element is, for me, key. And now, and now with the human rights resolution, which says that human rights must be protected offline and online, that involves trust online. Um, my first major point is about, uh, well, it's about privacy, but it's about self-determination on the Internet. Human rights, uh, the right to private life, and self-determination, what you do on the Internet. And Bruce Schneier mentioned in, in, the, in one of the documents in the delegate packs here about everybody in the middle and their ability to take control of their data. Uh, The question of consent is key in Europe, and it's being being worked out now uh, in the Council of Europe and in the European Union. What is consent, explicit consent? And are there really effective remedies in that context when it goes wrong? So we see data protection authorities fighting uh, certain companies, taking them to court. The law is being used more and more to try to work out the private life of people with regard to services terms of service, etc. So that's a very key point. Then there's, of course, freedom of expression and access to information is key. Um, we have had, there's been a lot of tra- discussion about um, the use of social media and hate speech and defamation and how do you work that out. And certain countries have been looking at the, how, how defamation works out. And criminal defamation is something that Frank LaRue mentions, which you shouldn't, the decriminalization, of course. Um, uh, another point in regarding uh, not hate speech or defamation, but about takedown of content, um, without due process and without proper safeguards. The question of safeguards and process is key. It remains key. Uh, you know, are, they, you know, is the, are the courts being used to take down content enough? People are saying no. Um, the question of access to information brings me to a, a very important case of the Court of Human Rights, uh, which said that you cannot blanket block access to sites, because if you do, this can be a violation of your freedom of expression. And the court found that in a case uh, in December last year. That was very, that was key. So now we have the first case which says that, you know, rights can be uh, violated online in in a European context. Um, And I think my my last point, which is about access, is about the discussion on net neutrality. And net neutrality uh, is a technical discussion. It's about the open internet. But the interference with an open internet and and the, the, the concern that do we want an internet which becomes a shopping mall, uh, which a shopping mall, uh, which, um, which is, you know, just it doesn't provide for freedom and openness and, and an le- and equal playing field for people and for services. Thank you. Thank you very much, and we will return to the issue of net neutrality a little later. Um, finally, let's turn to Moez and hear what he has to say from from North Africa perspective, and uh, I assume also Middle East. The floor is yours. Sorry, Moez, you'll have to introduce yourself. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Johan. Uh, uh, I will speak about the situation in Tunisia. You know, yeah, like this. So the Tunisia situation has so much in these uh, recent years. You know very well how we moved and how beyond everything we didn't have very good regulation. The government actually is looking forward to have a cyber crime law and, uh, and they consider it a draft project that was prepared before the revolution. So they, they, it was something that is very bad because in that draft program they said that it's based on the Budapest Convention, but at the same time we look on this uh, convention and we see that there is censorship, there is a lot of issues that has drafted on that project. 
hopefully we catch up after the revolution and we did a lot of things and these issues and now they're still drafting and I'm, I'm not sure that it could be published it soon because now there are a lot of changes and you know very well how things now are still moving forward. But I want to stress the importance of those conventions again. And I know that my colleague here from the Sea Council of Europe are hearing me. It's very important to, to, to have a better understanding of those conventions for the developing world. We can use those as a basis, but this could be also used for, 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 in, in, for a bad situation and without respecting all our upholding human rights. So uh, I, would, I would highlight that because the, I, th I thought that while working with other stakeholders in, in, in my country that there is a lot of misunderstanding about, about those conventions. So a lot of things need to be done there, capacity building, about privacy, and about what is the principles when you did some, some cyber, national cybercrime laws. I think this is uh, something that I want to highlight at first but uh, also, I want to highlight another thing is, is about uh, the, the role of the society and of the community. Actually, you know very well the situation in terms of there is no constitution, there is nothing. So it's really important to, that to, 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 uh, to raise those issues inside the community. The community is only, the, the, it, it is um, the only barrier or maybe the safeguards to, to, today, for example, for freedom online and, you know, for censorship, to prevent censorship. We have been... If something is blocked in the net, you can hear a lot of voices everywhere in the country saying, oh, there is censorship again. And if there is, people are still waiting for to say, no, we need to explain this. There's no censorship. Thank you so much, uh, Moez. Can I just explain? So when I show the yellow card, you actually still have 30 seconds. Okay. Ooh, okay. Good. Just, it seems to work better that way. And then red is when you have to stop. So, Moez, you have another okay, 30 I seconds. I will take this 30 minute second now, Good. please. <laughs> I used it for you. All right. Thank you very much, Moez. I know that you've been critical to, to the developments of online freedom in, in your country. So thanks very much for sharing this with us. Uh, before we leave the floor for two comments or questions, so you can start thinking of them right now, um, I'd like to revisit our hosts from the IGF last year. Um, they have uh, asked for, for, for the floor to give a little bit of their perspectives uh, of the developments in Azerbaijan compared to, to last year. I'm not quite sure where you're seated. Could you please um, identify yourself or sh show yourself? Person from Azerbaijan who asked for the floor. Who is this? No? All right, okay. So if they turn up, we'll... We'll give them the floor. No one? No? Okay, then the floor is open for two interventions uh, regarding these, th this very broad, broad account of what has happened globally in, in this arena. Please uh, don't hesitate, but uh, come with comments. Please introduce yourself as well. Thank you. Hi, Zahi Jimil. This is not the intervention that I wanted to make. This is just on the topics that have arisen. I wanted to just touch upon the point of the cybercrime. He's absolutely right. You know what ends up happening? Our governments, I'm from Pakistan, they did this. They said, this legislation is based on the Budapest Convention. That is why we're doing this. And they had a provision called cyber stalking censorship. Guess what? When I read the convention, it turned out that wasn't the case. And so it's absolutely right that we are being misled by our government saying, well, oh, no, there's a commitment out there, that's why we need to do that. So the capacity building exercise to make sure that civil society, business and others understand this is extremely essential. Otherwise, with the excuse of this, we're going to find repressive laws coming everywhere. Seems to be um, a common, uh, common theme in, in many parts of the, the world, uh, the quality of legislation. Anyone else would like to make an intervention at, at this point on the regional developments since last year? The floor is open. Right, if not... Um, oh, sorry, where? Great, a mic. Do you have people with running around with mics? No? Okay, great, sorry. Did you speak or... I'm Ali Akbar Musavi from Iran. 
uh, but I'm working with the International Campaign for Human Rights in Iran. Uh, since last year until now, we had a presidential election, and now, fortunately, we have a moderate president, and he promised something to change, uh, something ab about the uh, Internet, including uh, increasing uh, the speed of Internet in Iran, and also allowing uh, social media. So we want to keep, follow it, and uh, uh, to remem remember him to uh, keep his promise uh, in that regard. So this is a very good chance to encourage you and uh, to suggest the Iranian government to host uh, other events like IGF in the country uh, to see a lot of progress in the country as well. Thank you very much. We will now uh, give the final, final word in this part of the session to Amin Husseinov from Azerbaijan. If you get three minutes to say a few words about uh, the development since last year. Dear friends, I'm from Azerbaijan. One year ago, Azerbaijan's host country for IGF 2012. But what we have after one year? I'm very sad, but I don't have any good news with, for internet freedom in our country. Our IGF <coughs> government changed law, arrested new online activists. Right now we have nine journals in the prison, three bloggers, two human rights defenders, and lots of political activists. But also government doesn't not only change our law. If before we have deformation in print media, in TV and radio broadcast sphere, right now we have deformation. <laughs> it's possible for you arrested for three years if you made any notes for your f personal Facebook account or Twitter. Government continued blocked some of critical internet websites, but we don't have the same situation we have, for example, China or other, but right now we have partly free internet. And my things for why Azerbaijan not realize or promising which made uh, by Azerbaijan authorities before IGF. I think uh, IGF and IGF Secretariat and UN needs to organize uh, monitoring after IGF. If we organize, uh, if you organize this big event in country like Azerbaijan, you don't need made monitoring just only before this event. You need continued strong monitoring and make recommendations and give other feedbacks for net freedom in IGF host country. Thanks for your attention. We present special report. I understood for I don't have lots of time, but we prepare special report about what we have changed in uh, internet sphere in Azerbaijan. This it names is false freedom and we publish this, we have also print copies and PDF copies. Thanks for your attention. Thanks. Thank you, Amin, for that very strong statement. The gentleman over there, I'll give the final word to you. Please, the floor is yours. Please present Thank yourself. You. Um, I wasn't planning on speaking. First of all, my name is uh, Khalid Fatal. I'm group chairman of the Multilingual Internet Group. Um, uh, I wasn't planning on speaking, but I think uh, Zahid's comment uh, uh, instigated a, uh, a point that is relevant to this conversation, this debate, about how the misinformation at local level and how much capacity building we really have to make. And it goes to the question about uh, other efforts that have taken place in the, in the past. Let me share this with you. In 2012, my group conducted a major study of the Internet usability in emerging markets, and we focused to start with on Arabic language community, Farsi language community and Urdu language community. We conducted surveys 
in multiple languages aimed at these communities. I actually flew into many capitals, did seminars, uh, uh, and uh, we actually met with the regulatory heads of many of these countries. Let me share with you how much of a challenge it is to actually do the capacity building we're talking about. Majority of people do not know who ICANN is, let alone what is new GTLDs, let alone what is freedom of expression and how they can implement it. Majority of users on the Internet in those markets are happy being on Facebook and they think they're, they're speaking or they're doing illegal, illegal downloads. So there is a huge gap in how Internet can become this tool of empowerment to make them step into, the play, into that space so they become uh, Internet citizens and do what we want them to do so that they can do what Zahid is saying, that they'd be able to challenge their country or their government about what is necessary. Um, fundamentally, this is a huge challenge. As much as we like to hear our own voices and we're, we're doing what we're doing, we are still a close club. So and that we need to find a way of taking this conversation to the masses in, emerge, in emerging markets. So on a separate subject, we're trying to do some of that as well. Last month, we announced the series of summits that we're doing around emerging markets, around the, about the, on the seismic change to the global Internet and the birth of the multilingual Internet. Subject matter needs to be relevant to the local community to see how they can participate. We make it purely legal. You lose most of them. If you make it purely technical, most of them don't understand technology. They only understand, like we all walk into our houses, we flip the switch, light comes on. That's how they relate to the Internet. They do not see it as something that can empower them. And this is how I think we need to tweak the message and we tweak the mechanisms to take it to them. A huge challenge, but definitely is something that we need to engage in. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you for your intervention. We will now move on in the session to the next part, which uh, Anya will, will moderate. Uh, we will uh, give you the chance to comment also on regional developments further on. But I think we are now moving into a session which deals more with topical issues, and we have uh, decided to divide them into three different uh, sections. Please, Anya, explain more. Thank you, Johan. Um, I think uh, let us start with what some people have called the big elephant in the room, uh, the whole surveillance question. And uh, I would like to start perhaps by asking Nicholas Seidler from ISOC a question. Uh, we hear a lot about why surveillance is a privacy issue, but why would you say is it a freedom of expression issue as well? Thanks a lot. Um, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, so, um, actually, uh, I think that uh, from a technical community perspective, should I? Okay. So, from, from a, a technical community perspective, um, uh, if we actually uh, uh, look at uh, open internet standards, uh, the, the goal of these standards is really to allow uh, different decentralized networks to talk to each other. In a way, open standards are the language of the Internet, and by extension, they also allow people to communicate and to uh, uh, share information and ideas. So uh, that, that's the first thing I wanted to emphasize, the, the strong relationship between uh, the, the technical design of the Internet and freedom of expression. Now, the, the reality is not uh, so idyllic, uh, of course, and, and like often many, uh, like many other technologies, uh, the open Internet uh, is, can be double-edged uh, and can be used also in ways that undermine uh, fundamental rights, and we have seen that with uh, pervasive uh, surveillance. Um, so surveillance is, uh, is a great area of concern for the technical community, for the engineers, um, namely those who work on uh, technical standards. After all, when you look uh, back at the Internet pioneers, they created a network which was supposed to facilitate communication and not to be used as a tool to uh, uh, do global uh, surveillance. So uh, one last word very concretely, uh, again, to give that technical community perspective and what the tech community is doing regarding surveillance. Um, 
this is not a new concern uh, for the engineers, but the surveillance events have uh, clearly uh, generated a new motivation to address long-standing uh, security challenges. And at the opening of the IGF, I was listening carefully to uh, Yari Arko, the chair of the ITF, and I think he, um, he shared some very noteworthy and very strong visions uh, from a technical uh, perspective. One was that we should move from an Internet which is insecure by default to an Internet w which is secure by default. And I think that this community is also working on very ambitious targets to have more encrypted web traffic again by default. And at another meeting he also said um, uh, we should make surveillance more costly uh, not only in terms of financial costs, but also in terms of um, uh, getting caught when you do surveillance and be embarrassed. When you have a more open Internet, it's more difficult to, uh, to, uh, to do a secret surveillance. Um, but there are limits to, to what uh, technology can fix. Uh, I, I just wanted to mention three, and, and, and then I'll, I'll conclude. Um, well, technology can change the political context. So if a country uh, makes encryption illegal, uh, th there is not much that you can do. Uh, technology can uh, standards uh, also cannot change uh, the implementation of standards. And there I'm referring to, for example, commercial software uh, that are based on, on those standards. And finally, um, technology cannot help if users don't communicate with trusted peers uh, and that they don't themselves secure uh, communications. So, um, yeah, in a, in, a, in a nutshell, that's uh, what I would share on the technical community per perspective on privacy, freedom of expression, and the link to, uh, to those technical developments. Thanks a lot, Nicholas. Um, I wanted to move to uh, Michi Chaudhry from the Software Freedom Law Center. I can't see Michi, can you just, <coughs> I think she might have left the room. Um, she is here. It seems we have an immediate lit response. Let us just take that and Michi will come back to you after that. Sorry. Uh, Nena, go ahead. Uh, quickly before I run away, I just wanted to draw our attention to the web index the web index which is measuring the health of the internet, the open internet in about 80 countries, which, oh, I'm sorry, I was talking about the web index. I'm trying to tweet at the same time so people can follow online. The web index is an initiative of the Web Foundation which is measuring the health of the open and free internet across 80 countries. The Web Index 2013 will be launched during the ICTD in South Africa in December, and I do hope we will make good use of it. The other capital information I'd like to give is the one of the World Wide Web Foundation's initiative called Web We Want has established grants for organizations that are advocating for freedom on the web and human rights. So those are two opportunities that I would like to share with us on behalf of the Web Foundation before I step out. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Nena, for that contribution uh, as a little intermezzo. Um, let us move back to the surveillance question then. Mishi, what I wanted to ask you, Mishi is from the Software Freedom Law Center in India. What I wanted to ask you is, um, We've seen a lot of uh, uproar about surveillance as a global issue now. I think it has gotten increasingly recognition, recognition uh, for that. Is it a national issue as well? And I think there is a mic behind you if you don't have one. Okay.
When you say national issue, are you referring specifically to India or are you just saying that is it a national issue for every other nation involved? Um, you're very welcome to share the experience of India, but you can also comment a bit broader if you want. I think it's a national issue and the division is twofold. One is um, surveillance is the national listeners, all the local or national security agencies are going to be listening and surveilling and indulging in things which they have already been doing for years. Technology has made things a little more efficient. However, um, the issue is that at the national level whether the listening is subject to rule of law and uh, how this relates to the global level is whether the national governments, do they have any duty towards their citizens to protect them from the foreign surveillance or spying. So I think that's a twofold issue. In India's context, uh, we have something which is more sophisticated than by various um, programs coming out of GCHQ or U.S. government sponsored. It seems like, but it's a black hole, so we don't have a lot of information. We have central monitoring system. India does not have a privacy law or a legislation or a data protection law. We have a right to privacy as implicit in Article 21. And the central monitoring system is being rolled out. However, there is no parliamentary discussion and there is not much information out there. Whatever we have is things which have been either leaked out in the media and uh, it says it's a centralized system, people will have real-time access to the various interactions online, nine of India's uh, agencies would also have access, all of them not uh, have got, got nothing to do with um, uh, national security but are also agencies which are tax related, uh, which which are like the tax authorities of the country. So we don't have much official information. We have some information here and there. And I don't have time to talk about that in detail. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mishi. Um, I think uh, Pranesh Prakash from the Center for Internet and Society in India wants to briefly add something to that. Yes, uh, I just want to make two quick points. Uh, one, about how uh, what we are seeing now in the terms uh, in terms of surveillance uh, and how it affects free speech is uh, is not a continuance of just what used to be because uh, digital technologies have fundamentally altered that equation they have they are fundamentally allowing for mass surveillance of a sort now that was never in human history possible sure intelligence gathering, spying and espionage has always existed uh, and, and interception of communications has always ins- existed, bugging and actually placing people to listen in has always existed. It's on a scale, it's the, it's the change in scale that really puts freedom of speech uh, at a threat that it didn't earlier. Okay, that one point. The second quick point to uh, an example, an illustration of, of this uh, there, is, there was uh, a minister called Harin Pandya uh, in Gujarat. He was murdered in 2003 uh, and, and his murder still had not been brought to, uh, brought to book. Uh, he was, it is widely suspected, though never uh, proven, that he was murdered because he was the minister who actually deposed before a citizen's tribunal that was going into the Gujarat riots of 2002. How was he found out? Well, it was a secret meeting, but he had been using a a friend's SIM card. It was not even registered under his name, it was registered under a friend's name. And because the police, and he was at that point of time the Home Minister, because the police were able to get access to the call records of this, uh, of his phone, uh, it is suspected that they were able to track him as the descended minister who actually spoke out about the riots, and that led to his death. Thank you, Pranesh. Kind of taking off from that uh, comment you made, I want to uh, move to Mario Merzuki from the uh, EDRI, the European Digital Rights Institute, and CSAC, a civil society body. 
Um, Sanjay, we'll come back to you later. Is that okay? But I've noted it. Um, the point that uh, surveillance has gone to a completely different scale will obviously also have an impact on the relationship between privacy and freedom of expression. How do you see that relationship now? And perhaps also with all these revelations, are we today better off than six months ago because at least we have a better sense of what is going on? Yeah, thank you, Anya. Uh, actually, you used again this metaphor of the elephant uh, in the room, and I'm keeping hearing this. But I, I would like to insist uh, that also, uh, at the same time, you can see the forest from the trees. And we shouldn't discuss this issue of surveillance and other violation of the right to privacy through the sole NSA prism. Uh, first of all, government surveillance uh, shouldn't let us forget about corporate uh, firms' online tracking of users, and this also can have a chilling effect on uh, freedom of expression, on the expression of uh, Internet users. This includes, uh, this corporate firms includes telecom operators, software provider, and online service uh, uh, provider. So this collection and, and tracking of, of users you know, is also used to profile citizens. And we have seen with the NSA uh, scandal that uh, there is a kind of convergence between the objectives of governments for surveillance, uh, be it for intelligence or law enforcement uh, purposes, and also the uh, tracking of the corporate uh, firms for uh, commercial uh, users. Uh, second, uh, we shouldn't forget, I would like to get back uh, to the issue of the uh, national surveillance because this is uh, very uh, important. Uh, most governments, if not all around the world, have adopted at national level laws allowing them to conduct massive and systematic uh, collection of uh, communication and traffic data. For instance, through data retention laws, and we have a lot of them in Europe because this is the European Union legislation now. And uh, f we, we have to, to be conscious that uh, these are not simple technical uh, data, but this data also allows the mapping, uh, a true cartography of citizens, their activities, their online activities, and their uh, personal uh, relationships. So this is also, um, this also has a strong impact on uh, uh, freedom of expression because it will lead to self, uh, censorship of, uh, of users. So there is an obvious uh, link between uh, privacy, uh, personal data protection, and freedom of expression. Thank you. I see several hands. Um, I, earlier, Sanjay, uh, Sanjay wanted to come in. I think you are also reporting back from a workshop, right? Uh, I know John Kampfer has also been in a workshop that looks at these issues. So let's perhaps take these two reports now. Uh, We'll come back to you, sir, later. Sanja, why don't you go ahead first? Uh, just to directly address the issue on how surveillance may, might affect freedom of expression. Uh, and by the way, my name is Sonia Kelly, and I work at Freedom House. One thing that we've seen in our research is that surveillance leads to self-censorship, and that's one direct link. What we've seen in many countries around the world is that uh, when there is broad surveillance of citizens, particularly in countries where rule of law is lacking, then people start being careful what and how they see, say things online. We have seen in particular the, fact, the effect of this in authoritarian states where very often political activists or even everyday users found the police knocking on their door uh, because the authorities were able to monitor uh, those citizens and things that they say online. Um, one thing that we've seen more generally is that surveillance, particularly on the national level, has been on the increase. And I know that a lot of people want, are focusing right now on what's happening in the United States and how that affects the broader global community. But what we've seen, at least in our research, and I'm from Bosnia, but what we've seen in our research is that when you talk to a person in uh, Bahrain, when you talk to a person in Russia, 
they're not really afraid uh, and they're not self-censoring because of the NSA surveillance, but they're actually afraid what their national security uh, uh, agencies are going to do to them if they criticize the authorities. So uh, I think that's really the bottom line, and that's something that we really need to focus uh, on to in addition to what's happening in the United States. If you would like me to, I can also mention a couple of additional conclusions from the workshop, or we can get to that later. Um, thank you, Sanja. Um, John, maybe you can also add some perspectives from your workshop. Yeah, I just I was going to be very brief. I mean, it, it came up on, in, in that particular workshop as well, Freedom Online, um, but also the one that I was um, chairing on behalf of the, the GNI yesterday, and that is the, the political foreign policy uh, side of freedom of expression promotion and that its relationship with surveillance and the prison story. And it's a self-evident point, but it's one that I can't see institutions yet, such as this or others, um, being able to grapple with, which is the credibility of the genuinely held proselytization of freedom of expression uh, by freedom online countries and others um, around the world and how that reconciles with, you know, the double standards, hypocrisy agenda, um, accusation uh, with regard to surveillance. That came up um, from a number of interventions both in the panel and on the floor, um, most notably for those who were in the room yesterday from a Chinese delegate who um, started haranguing the U.S. delegate saying, you know, you have nothing to teach us um, about freedom of expression. Now, beyond the rhetoric and, and, and the point scoring, there's a fundamental question for policymakers, but for institutions such as here that seems to have come out a lot this week, and I'm sure will come out in the surveillance uh, open forum tomorrow, which is how, the, the, to most people, certainly to my eyes, the, the positive and quite effective hitherto uh, foreign policy side of freedom of expression promotion can be reconciled to what's been going on. Thank you, John, uh, for these important reminders. Um, Rather than perhaps focusing on governments, I think uh, that duplicity is something that businesses have also been accused of. So following on uh, Miriam's important reminder that surveillance also happens by businesses, not only by governments, let me maybe turn to Ross Lajunes from Google. Before we take your comment in the back, and after that comment, I will also come back to check if there's any comments from uh, remote participants or from Twitter. Uh, but first, let's hear Ross. So I'm supposed to respond to the accusation that governments are surveilling, that, no, that you, companies you, you are surveilling can, their you, users? Is that it? You can respond uh, <laughs> to the question, what are businesses going to do to repair the trust of users that's very, very, very obviously broken? Yes, we're very, very, very aware of that. Um, we, uh, as you said, we, we care very much about the relationship we have with our users, and so we've always uh, prided ourselves on putting a our user first and thinking that all else will follow. And so the revelations, the Snowden revelations, were very aware did serious damage to uh, the, the faith that many users uh, have in us as a company, and we've been working very hard uh, to assure our users that they can continue to trust us with their information and continue to use our, our services. Um, I'm actually uh, very proud of the role that Google has always played when it comes to issues uh, like protecting our users and, and especially on the issue of transparency, where for three years we've been uh, recognizing the fact that our users have a right to know what governments uh, are seeking from them, what information and the request that governments are making uh, to platforms like us for uh, user data. Um, it's not something that we've come to recently because we want to save our, you know, reputation with our users. We've been doing this for years and years. We spent almost two years secretly uh, negotiating with the U.S. government, for example, to allow us to reveal the numbers of national security letter requests that we get uh, at a time when we weren't even legally allowed to talk about that. We were nevertheless doing that behind the scenes because we thought it was important. Um, we're really happy to see that another, uh, a number of companies have joined us in, um, in doing their own transparency reports. And it's not to say that transparency is the answer to any of this, but you can't really have a debate about these issues when you don't even know the facts. 
and that's still the situation we're in. Uh, the Snowden revelations, you know, have given us some information, but they haven't given us the information we really need to have a constructive debate about this stuff, which is why we sued the U.S. government, uh, along with some other companies, to try and force them to allow us to even talk about this in the way that we want to. Uh, thanks, Ross. Uh, sir, in the back, there is a microphone here. Um, we will take one more comment from the floor, but after this comment, I'll first come to Twitter and remote. Yeah, yeah thank you. Actually, I, I'm, I want to ask uh, of someone from Turkey, if available here, to tell us a story about how the Ottoman Empire made the wrong mistake when they found the, the Gutenberg, which is like the Internet of today. They banned it for a hundred years instead of uh, you know, making it to, to the benefit of the people. But what I want to suggest here is another thing is, I think if you look at this surveillance and, free, uh, and freedom of uh, speech, I, I look at other way, which is sometimes the unfairness is if there is a surveillance, especially by commercial word, is that because the people under surveillance did not really aware of these things, uh, and was taken advantage of. So what about if I suggest something maybe a bit controversial? If there is any surveillance at all, then the information gathered by the surveillance should be accessible to public. So for instance, you know, when I carry my iPad, iPad everywhere, Apple knows where I am and where I go at certain time. So Apple would be have to give this information to the public. Therefore, everybody quickly will be aware what kind of surveillance is done under them so they can take measures and, and this awareness will increase so rapidly. So people know if they don't want to be known then they should leave their smartphone behind or something like that. So only, only a very limited uh, institution for a clear uh, danger to society that is allowed to keep the information of their surveillance only to themselves. This unfairness to those who have all this information about millions and millions of people and, do, and millions and millions of people who doesn't even aware that they are being surveillance. So let's just be more open, put them all there so we all can see. Thank you. Actually, this is perhaps also the right time to refer to a website and the set of principles called necessary and pro, uh, proportionate.org which actually is a list of principles uh, that, among other things, highlight precisely that, the need to be transparent, uh, but also to make sure that surveillance only happens when it is really, really needed, and only to the extent that it's, that it's absolutely required. So thank you for that uh, important reminder. Um, I'll go to uh, check, are there any questions from remote? No, no nothing from remote? Anything from Twitter? Our uh, Twitter moderators would like to report back on? Okay. It seems that uh, the questions that were asked have been answered by the room, so you've been very, very uh, proactive. Uh, were there any more workshops that would like to report back on this particular segment? No? Then maybe we have time for one or two more comments? Yes. I see one here and one there. Why don't you go first, sir, and then... Okay. Um, oh, I'm... <coughs> yeah. I'm not... Let's go ahead with this yes. one first. Um, Walid al um a researcher in online censorship. Uh, I've uh, come to know and understand that uh, surveillance is, as mentioned before, uh, obviously a violation of the freedom of expression because of cases of self-censorship. But what is even more dangerous is when people do not know that they are surveilled. So that's even much more catastrophic because the moment that Facebook, for example, says, all right, and, and, or Google, your information would be used for marketing purposes, the consent of the user is in itself one way of him or her to understand the risk. But cases of, of unethical or perhaps dramatic proportions when the person itself himself does not understand that he or she is surveilled, that's much more serious. And that's why the scandals are more serious than anything that had ever been 
revealed so far. Uh, and a proposal, I mean, obviously the issue of the NSA scandal is something that governments need, deal to, need to deal on a policy level. But for companies such as Google, for example, one often uh, propo- proposal that we hear from activists is that why not allow by default the ability to have end-to-end encryption, something that could be embedded on an on email client level. Something similar could perhaps be innovative. I mean, technicians and geeks can always find a way if there is a will within companies to enable face-to-face, I mean, interface-to-interface encryption. So if you were on a browser and sending a private Facebook message, this message would be encrypted on the client level and then arrive to the particular person on his or her computer based on encryption on the client level. I mean, so it would enable uh, only the two persons to understand what's been you know, transferred. So I understand that there are certain marketing implications, but trust of users is much more important at this stage. Thanks, Wahid. We'll take Brett's comment first, then we'll come to you, then we'll move on to the next session. Uh, just by way of information, I think uh, a group of people in Iceland, among others, is trying to develop a secure email client that's still web-based. So, uh, Brett, Solomon for Mike. Thanks very much. Um, I just wanted to actually report uh, from a session as a feed-in to this, which was also on surveillance. Uh, it was one of the flash sessions from yesterday uh, looking at the necessary and proportionate principles uh, which have been signed by, I think, 280 organisations around the world. Um, and it looks as, at a series of 13 principles, uh, including issues around legality, legitimate aim, necessity, proportionality, etc. Uh, and I think we're starting to see a little bit of state adoption. Uh, the principles are addressed uh, to states. Uh, we saw at the Seoul conference last week, uh, Carl Bildt, the minister from Sweden, foreign minister, using the principles as the basis uh, of his presentation to the other ministers in the room. And I think we're starting to see some normative development around the application of international human rights to communication surveillance. Thanks, Brett. Please, go ahead. Hi, uh, Mike Harris from Index on Censorship. Um, It's really important that we talk about PRISM. It's really important we talk about NSA surveillance. But we also need to make sure we don't take our eye off the ball with the very real threats, the real physical threats that are happening to human rights defenders and online activists across the world today. This report from the IFRS on internet freedom in Azerbaijan after the IGF is a salutary reminder that our previous hosts have renegated on all of their promises to uphold online freedom of expression. They've engaged in physical attacks against human rights defenders. They've engaged in serious and systematic surveillance against human rights defenders. And I think while we must make sure that we uphold the highest standards in Western democracies, I think if we totally ignore what authoritarian states are doing and buy into their narrative, which is, you are all the same, you are all hypocrites, we very, very easily forget that right now, today, across the globe, net citizens are being physically attacked and imprisoned and often murdered for standing up and speaking out. And we mustn't forget that. Thank you very much for that reminder. Uh, It's actually a very nice lead into the next block, you could say, from uh, uh, this afternoon, which will look specifically at freedom of expression issues uh, in the way we do this more traditionally. Ross, I just wanted to check with you um, whether you perhaps wanted to to respond to Wahid's comment or request uh, from Google's perspective. We we certainly recognize that our users benefit by encryption, which is why we do search uh, by encryption in all cases. And uh, with our Chrome, sorry, with our Chrome browser, there's encryption available on that. But uh, I can't say that it's, that it's perfect or that all of our services are perfect, but uh, we recognize the importance of that and we're working toward it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ross. Shall we move into the next session then, Noam? Absolutely. 
Whereas we're um, trying to define what constitutes the proper, proper human rights in, in the real space, um, some people are trying to understand how human rights apply in, in cyberspace or in this online environment. And uh, particularly freedom of expression has come to the forefront in, in recent years. Um, and uh, maybe to dwell a little bit on, on freedom of expression online, we've asked first uh, Mr. Guy Berger from, from UNESCO. Uh, what do you think, Guy? Is, is, is speech online? Is it, is it more threatened than, than speech offline? And, and is there any normative work that, that could defend free speech online? Uh, 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 thank you, Johan. So, uh, I think the position in the UN is, is certainly that all the rights that exist offline should exist online, and those include the right to freedom of expression. And, of course, what happens in the one sphere can have impact on the other sphere, uh, forwards and backwards. I think what's important in the freedom of expression, though, that we understand that uh, in terms of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, it's not only the freedom to express in the sense of, of sending messages, it's also the freedom to seek and receive. So the, uh, the, the, the UN Declaration of Human Rights has the two-sided dimension, two sides of the same coin. And that becomes very important because, of course, if, you're, if you only have one, you can only express yourself that people are not able to, to, to hear you or receive you, it's not much point. On the other hand, if uh, people can receive but uh, there's a limit on expression, again, it's not the full freedom. So I think what's important about this is that it brings you to understanding the significance of blocking and filtering as impacting on that side of the right to freedom of expression, the side of accessing information. And, of course, we often speak about access, but not always about the right to access. And, but in terms of uh, the, the freedom of expression concept, it includes both. I think then what becomes important also is in the same way that one could say that it's not surveillance per se that's a problem, but illegitimate surveillance, uh, the question of rights and blocking and filtering, it's not blocking and filtering per se that's necessarily the problem, it's illegitimate blocking and filtering. So in the same way that one would say, what are the legitimate limitations uh, for expression, um, what are the legitimate limitations that could take the form of blocking and filtering? And uh, certainly the, the UN position, as, as articulated by Frank LaRue, is that the norm is the freedom and the limitations are the exception. And the limitations themselves have to be limited. And people have now referred with, with respect to the surveillance, limitations, 13 principles proposed by civil society that, that would make surveillance legitimate. If surveillance took place according to those 13 principles, civil society would say that's a legitimate limitation in the interest of other rights, the right to security or the right to privacy and so on, it would be a balance. They would say, civil society, surveillance in that case is not a violation of rights, it's a limitation of rights, it's a legitimate limitation. So when you come back to this question of blocking and filtering on the internet, which is still a huge thing and maybe we've lost a bit of sight of it in the recent uh, time in the post Snowden era, Blocking and filtering, it really needs to be considered from the point of view, what is legitimate blocking and filtering? And an interesting exercise is to what extent the same principles that have been proposed by the civil society people that are in the International Covenant on uh, Civil and Political Rights, uh, a version of which has been articulated by Carl Bildt recently, to what extent are those principles also applicable to the question of blocking and filtering, which, as I said, is a key part of the, 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 the question of... Um, freedom of expression. Thank you. So, so basically the, the same restrictions that are, are, are possible to limit freedom, freedom of expression in the real world are the same limits that we use in, in the online environment. Well, uh, as I said, the norm in both environments should be that there are not restrictions. If there are restrictions, they should be by the same standards, which they are only legitimate if it's in the interest of protecting other rights, if it goes through certain processes of transparency, being in law, proportionality, legitimacy, etc. But surely in, in some countries uh, working with, with particular issues that deal with uh, perceived as, as particularly sensitive, um, but surely they are more restricted than, than others, um, at least that, that's, that's, my, that's my picture. And I'd like to, to ask, I'd like to go to uh, Bishaka Data now. 
from, from India. You're a gender and sexuality rights activist, and I was keen to know your perspective on, on freedom of expression online. Uh, what, 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 is, what is your experience in, in your work? Okay, uh, so what I would like to say, sorry, what I'd like to say from the perspective of gender and sexual rights is I think, as we all know, one of the main purposes for which the internet has been used quite legitimately, in my opinion, is actually for activities related to sex or sexuality. And while most people think that that means viewing porn, I would actually argue that there's a much wider range of activity. Very quick five examples. Think of an HIV positive person who looks up how to use, how to wear a condom online. Think of um, a lesbian woman who can't safely, you know, associate offline, uses the online space. Think of a disabled woman who, you know, maybe looks up porn online. Think of migrant workers having cyber sex, etc. There's a whole bunch of things that happen. What I wanted to say is that, unfortunately, all of these get clubbed under sexual content which is seen sort of intrinsically as harmful content. And the problem then becomes that we end up with attempts to ban all sexual content which is sort of lumped under pornography, right? So I think from a rights perspective, we need to really start, all of us live in countries where there are guarantees of freedom of expression, and under that freedom or the right to free expression, I think we should start making the right to sexual expression far more explicit. The time has come when it needs to be named and sort of protected, otherwise it just goes into a different zone altogether. That's one. The second thing I think is that because there's been such a big sort of morality discourse at policy levels around pornography and sort of a harm discourse, the key thing that affects women as well as, you know, uh, sexuality groups, etc., is getting completely left out of the policy picture. And that, in my opinion, is consent. One example, when a woman, in India we had a very famous case many years ago, where a boy and a girl were having sex, this was filmed on a cell phone and it was circulated, it went viral. The issue was everybody started saying, oh my God, you know, this is terrible and this is dirty and this is immoral, but that is completely irrelevant. The point was that she agreed to something, she consented to something for private use. She did not consent to something for public use, but the entire consent thing was just sort of completely dismissed, right? And the final point in 30 seconds, Amrieta, is um, that, you know, as gender and se sexual rights groups, we sometimes look for protection under things like hate speech. So there's a proposal to sort of put gender as a specific category under hate speech, and I'm sympathetic to that, but I think what we need to keep in mind is that hate speech is understood very differently in the public sphere than it is in the policy sphere, and that we don't want like a situation where every time someone says, you know, the word bitch, which I loathe, I loathe the word. That's not the point. We don't want every single thing to be sort of loosely put under hate speech because then you end up with nothing that is specifically protected as, as hate speech and a generation of Internet users who think like any w word that causes discomfort is sort of this giant hate speech violation. And that, I think, actually takes away freedom of expression as well. Thank you. We're moving into an area now where it's about um, several rights that come into play. One person's dignity versus another person's right to free speech. Um, and I'd like to turn now to, to Beryl Aidi. Beryl, where are you? You're there. You belong to the Kenyan Human Rights Commission, right? And um, what, what, are, what are your experiences from, from, from Kenya? It's been a turbulent few years and also on, on free expression, I suppose, on, in, in the political life. What is your experience in, in this regard? Well, um, Kenya is relatively free as far as uh, freedom of expression is concerned. Um, with most people able to express themselves freely uh, without too much restriction. However, um, 
with regard to political expression, sometimes there's been restrictions uh, where individuals uh, express um, or rather exercise uh, self-censorship and uh, this is uh, in response to threats by the regulatory body which is the com- uh, Communication Commission of Kenya uh, that has threatened to institute um, legal proceedings on people who are caught um, propagating dangerous speech. And uh, this is mainly in light uh, of uh, hate speech and, um, uh, and uh, inciting violence. However, as far as individual rights are concerned and uh, defamation, um, there's also been cases where uh, individuals have been taken to court by others uh, because of def- defamation. And uh, the laws that they've been relying on are the clawback laws that uh, existed before uh, the promulgation of the new constitution that uh, still remain in place, uh, the defamation laws, the libel laws. uh, So these ones are still very much in place. And uh, a few individuals have relied on them. They've sued um, other individuals and also sued um, uh, news agencies and media houses. Now, as far as individual cases are concerned, we really haven't seen any case coming to conclusion. So uh, at the moment, I would just say there's still a number of cases that are in court. And then also, as far as the media houses are concerned, um, you find that um, while there is uh, a lot of press freedom and um, um, sufficient enough to allow people to to say as much as what they want to say, uh, individuals have also found themselves uh, victims of uh, defamation by the media as far as uh, certain issues are concerned. Now, there's a very thin line between defamation, uh, defamation and speaking the truth because sometimes cases uh, that have been reported are actually the truth and in, that, in such cases you find that uh, the individuals concerned have remained silent. A uh, classic case is an example of... Um, a former um, high-ranking government official's wife who was caught in compromising situations in an, an affair. And uh, that's it, that case made uh, a lot of media coverage and a lot of online um, uh, 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 discussion, but uh, the couple in concerned have not responded in any way. Uh, finally, I just want to say this Kenyans have also reacted in a certain way that um, has made um, the media be careful about what they say. This is the Kenyan public, and especially as far as um, uh, Kenyan politics are concerned and with the relation with foreign media. Uh, you find that uh, Kenyans on Twitter have become very militant sometimes and have defended the country in a way that has made the foreign media a little bit um, uh, sensitive uh, regarding what they report. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is, is that a, a, something that you think will, will continue? Will that be a, a continuing trend in, in your country? Um, oh, which one? The one of Kenyans taking... I think it's a trend, but then again, uh, it's usually something that takes place maybe a day or, uh, for a day or two, and then uh, they go silent again. Uh, and it's not just taking on the media, but taking on anyone who seems to attack Kenyans. Kenyans are very peculiar. They seem to come together when uh, one of them, one of their own is attacked, but then they are also quite readily, uh, they are ready to attack themselves uh, online as well. So you find um, occasionally hashtags like someone tell uh, Nigeria, someone tell Botswana, someone tell CNN, someone tell uh, France 24. Uh, this um, uh, individuals are beginning such hashtags to set the record straight, which most of the cases have been Really true. Yes. I'd like to pick now up on, on, a, on a thread that our friend from Index on Censorship uh, mentioned a, w- a little while ago. Um, that, that it's quite common also to suppress uh, speech through um, intimidation and persecution uh, after one has exercised its, um, your, your freedom of speech online. Um, is, is this something that we're seeing more of or less of? And I'd like to turn to uh, Ramiro Alvarez Ugate. Where are you, Ramiro? There, Ramiro. Um, could you comment on, on, on this from, from your perspective? And please also tell us where, where you are from and what you do. 
Thank you very much. I'm uh, Ramiro Alvarez from the Association for Civil Rights of Buenos Aires, Argentina. Um, I think uh, the, the first question you asked about the difference between online and offline freedom of speech is a very important question. And to an extent, it's related to the one you, you asked me because I believe that what we begin to see in Latin America uh, and obviously I know more uh, of cases in Argentina but also in other countries um, is that as, as the internet is increasingly used and the debate that takes place there is seen as increasingly relevant the attention of, of public officials especially towards the importance of the expressions that take place on the internet grows uh, a lot um, in some countries of Latin America for instance we have seen the growing number of uh, suits and, and criminal charges against people who express themselves in Twitter or in Facebook. And that's a, a discouraging trend. We, as Eduardo could, could tell you in detail, in Latin America we have fought for many, many years to get criminal libel, uh, laws out of our law books. We have fought to to eliminate all those kinds of uh, crimes that would, uh, to an extent, uh, affect freedom of expression. And what we've seen now, for instance, in Argentina, in a, just a couple of weeks ago, there has been a, a threat of a, a civil suit, of a libel suit, uh, against a person who expressed himself in Twitter, who is not famous, who is not... Uh, uh, who just takes part in public debate using Twitter. Um, I think that's, uh, that's a problem, obviously, because to a journalist, to established journalist, or to established media outlet, a threat of criminal libel or even civil libel uh, might not be as bad or could not have such a big chilling effect. But in the case of people who express themselves in Twitter, that the chilling effect might, might be much, much worse. Thank you very much. I also know in the room we have uh, Ellery Biddle from Global Voices. Um, perhaps you'd like to comment also on, uh, on, on this particular issue of, of uh, uh, netizens and what, what risk they face um, in connection with their use of free expression online. I know this is something you work a lot with. Sure, thank you. Um, my name is Ellery Biddle and I'm from the United States. Um, I'm the editor of a project within the Global Voices Citizen Media Network that is dedicated to covering um, threats to bloggers and what I've started to call online speakers' rights, um, both online and off. So whether it's online censorship or actually direct threats to individuals um, who are expressing themselves online, that that is what we cover. We've got writers in many different parts of the world. Um, and one thing that's kind of interesting about our network and that I think can be valuable in these kinds of discussions is that we have, our writers are both telling stories about people under threat in their own countries and then they also often become protagonists in those stories. And it puts us in, in, into sort of a difficult situation where we're both trying to cover news and at the same time actually actively help our colleagues who might be facing uh, a legal threat, just, you know, like a suit like Ramiro just mentioned, or who are actually um, arrested or, you know, put in. We had an um, author in Bahrain who was detained for about eight weeks this year with, um, it was difficult to even know if he had been formally charged. His attorney was arrested a week after he was and essentially forbidden from defending him. And we sort of found ourselves in a situation where we we're kind of desperate for help from our colleagues in kind of the higher level policy community. Like, what, what do we do um, with, you know, a person who's in a country with a government where trying to just intervene as an attorney might, in a place where, you know, there's real due process, um, wasn't going to work. And we're really lucky he's been released on bail and we're not sure what's going to happen next. But this is a situation that we're encountering all the time um, and that we're kind of working to prepare ourselves for better as a community by being more connected to people in the sort of policy and legal spaces and also with networks like um, 
the Committee to Protect Journalists and other groups that can do emergency assistance. But it's, um, it's something that I think just here at IGF is super important is that there's a lot of discussion about human rights, but often not, I think, enough focus on human beings, on individuals and the actual challenges that they're facing that are developing and changing all the time. Um, so thank you. Thank you very much. We've heard now uh, stories about uh, the limitations on, on free expression, what it means to certain, to certain kind of activists. We heard what it means to certain professional groups. We heard what it means to activists, um, online and offline. Um, does anyone want to make, uh, make some comments here? And then we'll have some comments from, from the workshop people as well. We start there, and then the lady in green, and then Nicholas. Thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Shahla Rashid, and I work on. Closer. Please, closer. My name is uh, Shahla Rashid. I work on uh, internet policy in India. Um, and if anyone who followed uh, the discussions around free speech in India in the past one year would know how every uh, discussion on free speech would basically turn into a debate between new media and traditional media. And uh, while uh, the, uh, the traditional journalists complain that. Uh, Internet uh, users do not have any regulation. They do not have to go through editorial controls. They can post whatever they want without any responsibility. And whenever the government uh, regulates anything, uh, the regulation applies to traditional media, but not to new media. Uh, while uh, the new media uh, users or, let's say, uh, citizen journalists or bloggers would allege that media houses uh, offer more protection to journalists, and we don't enjoy that kind of protection. And this is an unending debate, and there can be different perspectives and different situations. But what I really want to say is that the need is to uh, draw more solidarity from one another's causes, because right now I see a lot of uh, debate between what is, uh, whether, off, whether, there's more, uh, whether there are more free speech guarantees offline or whether there are more free speech guarantees online, but I think this is something we are doing wrong. We really need to uh, draw solidarity uh, from one another's uh, causes. Uh, so, for example, in India right now, uh, the, the judiciary is one of the, uh, one of our, uh, you know, one of those institutions that we trust will protect our rights, to protect our rights. And uh, uh, right now, the appointment of the Supreme Court uh, judges, uh, the government does not have any say in it uh, as of now. Uh, the, the appointment of judges is uh, done by people who are, uh, by the former Supreme Court judges itself, so there is a collegiate system. But now the government wants to have a say in the appointment of judges as well. And that is a free speech concern for online, offline, anyone. That's a free speech concern for pretty much anyone. And uh, th there is a need to draw solidarity from the traditional women's movement, the traditional free speech movement, and uh, not pit them uh, against one another. That's briefly what I wanted to say. Thank you very much. We have uh, the, the lady in the, the green shirt, please. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Erica Smith. I work with the APC in Mexico on a project that's mapping tech-related violence against women. And I'm really interested in, in the many intersections that I'm hearing. Mexico, as many of you know, is a place where it's very difficult and dangerous to be a journalist. You may also know that um, Central America and Mexico region is a very difficult place to be a woman human rights defender. Um, these are both professions that will get you killed. And uh, I, I think that when we look at those people who are exercising a profession of defense, of investigation, of speaking out, we always know these people face special vulnerabilities, but frequently we are not looking into the vulnerability that, from a gender lens. Examples can be that it is very effective to call women sluts, talk about their sexual behavior, get access to their private information, and journalists who are being uh, paraded in a sexual fashion who are women are then discredited. They can no longer practice their profession with the same professionalism, and the worst thing is they, the, this isolates them from many of their male and female colleagues. And 
I think in other sessions people have talked about, well, if you're a formal journalist, you'll have the backing of your paper. But I'm not quite sure which country that is. Most of the journalists that I know don't have the backing of a paper. They're freelancers. They're working for many papers. And the precariousness of the profession makes this triply difficult for women. So once they're isolated, once they've been sexualized and victimized in this way where they just can't take the total attack, then a lot of times that's when the death threats roll in in private emails. And that's when they realize how out they, there, there they are thanks to the triangularization of private data. And this is the reality for women human rights defenders, and it's been documented. We're, n we're not talking about that really famous, amazing national reporter. Yeah, she's under threat, and so is he. But we're talking about the women human rights defenders and journalists who are in local communities, who are facing such terrible threats, and a lot of them can be tracked. So it's a connection with surveillance, it's a connection with privacy, but it's also a really important need to look at this from a gendered point of view. Because what happens, the attacks are dismissed, that's just, you know, violent speech, it's not a for real thing, don't worry about it. But when you live in a rape culture, when you live in that reality and someone is putting that Google Street View picture of your home or where your child goes to school, the fear factor is incredible. So of course there is self-censorship, of course there's complete interruption into your personal life. The other facet of this, and I think it's really important, is that there's a lot of fear mongering about um, uh, the need for cyber grooming, uh, cyber grooming laws uh, or cyber bullying legislation. So we're beginning to see knee-jerk legislation in many of our states and countries that is absolutely violating civil rights, children's youth rights, and people's access to information about sex, for example. And that local level control is determining internet governance. Thank you very much. Uh, Nicholas, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot. Uh, I, I just wanted to get back very briefly to uh, the issue of uh, blocking and filtering and stress that um, I mean, even if an order of filtering and blocking content comes from a legitimate source, it's still a very ineffective way to remove content uh, for several reasons. First of all, it doesn't actually remove the content. If you know the IP address, to a certain web page, you can still access it. And secondly, it's a very undiscriminate measure. So basically, if you remove a domain name, you might both um, prevent people uh, from accessing both illegal and legal content. So actually, usually a better approach if, again, there is a legitimate order uh, uh, about uh, content is to remove that content at the source rather than to uh, block uh, a domain name. Thank you. It's a wide array of issues relating to freedom of expression. I would also like to have some feedback from, from the workshops. Um, I know that Guy would like to say a few words about the workshops he's been involved in. Guy Berger, the floor is yours. Uh, uh, thank you. I think it would be interesting for people here to hear briefly about two workshops. The one yesterday was on the future of independent journalism. So that was really concerned with the users of freedom of expression who use that, that right to do journalism, whether it's formal journalism or whether it's an, a more an informal contribution to public discourse. Um, generally speaking, this workshop points out the, the, the value to society of journalism becoming open journalism involving a lot more contributors than used to be the case. Um, but at the same time, they point out that this use of freedom of expression does need a, uh, somebody to pay for it. And uh, in this sense, um, the, the kind of uh, uh, full-time journalists are complemented rather than by um, journalists who are just doing it on a voluntary basis. And uh, so uh, the discussion looked at the different business models that, uh, that are coming out to try and support um, proper uh, in-depth uh, well-researched, etc., journalism, uh, looking at various kinds of things, including subsidies from the tech world, <laughs> such as Jeff Bezos uh, and, and the Washington Post, but lots of other models, such as the Economist using social media, 
Um, this is based on research by the World Economic Forum, which presented in this workshop. The, the uh, Global Voices uh, and their volunteer network and the possibility for them to develop paid partnerships with media was interesting. Uh, and then the discussion went on to say it, it's great to have this use of freedom of expression. It's great if you can get a business model, but it also uh, needs safety. So uh, some issues were touched on there, and I'll move in quickly into the second workshop. Uh, safety. Uh, the UN has this uh, UN plan of action on safety of journalists, which is now looking at indicators for digital safety, which include things like, are journalists aware of digital dangers? Are they taking measures uh, uh, to deal with them? Are they trained? Do they have access to the software and equipment? ISPs, what is their position on protecting freedom of expression online in terms of the security of data that they have, uh, the transparency they're reporting on, uh, on, on attempts to... to um, compromise freedom of expression. And uh, further on this uh, question of safety, uh, there's a research project that UNESCO is actually doing, and it's, it's identified, inventorized about seven different areas of digital dangers that uh, journalists are facing to their use of freedom of, freedom of expression. Um, the point was very much made that the same protections that tend to apply to formal journalists should apply to bloggers the right to protect sources, accreditation issues, guarantees of safety, and there are increasing uses of lawsuits against journalists, against bloggers who don't get enough support. Legal security is very important, uh, particularly in terms of defamation cases. And uh, the point was made that citizen documentation of key events such as the Brazilian protests is really becoming important in a context where mainstream media is not uh, able to cover those issues uh, substantially. That's it. Brilliantly. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Sanya, did you want to take the floor to, to talk about the workshop you had? Sanya and then Jack, I think, who is beside. Yeah? Uh, I'm reporting on the workshop number 220, Human Rights Online. Uh, and one of the main themes of the workshop is that Human Rights Online have been under growing threat in recent years, and those threats come from uh, various arenas. Uh, one of the key things that we highlighted is that blocking and filtering uh, of unwanted content has been uh, on a great increase in recent years. Um, and this blocking and filtering is not only of individual pages, but what we have seen in recent years is that uh, whole applications or entire social media platforms are being blocked and these are some of the key platforms that people use to express themselves. Among other things that were identified are physical attacks. And it seems like more and more users who post things online that are critical of the government or that expose corruption or other issues are not only being harassed, but in more extreme cases, they're being killed. We touched upon the issue of surveillance, which is a growing problem throughout the world. Uh, and I'm not going to speak uh, more about that, but uh, also things like intermediary liability and data localization were found to be issues uh, from the human rights perspective as well, because in the grand scheme of things, they do limit uh, free flow of information. Uh, finally, one thing that uh, was very apparent is that uh, many governments do not really practice what they preach, so in these multi-stakeholder environments, it seems like everyone is in favor of the principle of multi-stakeholderism. But what we found and what was said during the workshop is that most governments, when they go back home and when they create these new laws and practices, they really don't consult various stakeholders. And this is something that uh, really needs to be on agenda. And finally, uh, one of the greatest problems was the proliferation of new laws and policies, uh, many of which are extremely restrictive when it comes to freedom of expression online. And the conclusion was that this is really the critical moment in history when most countries are looking to pass new legislation on how to regulate content. So it is extremely important to set examples of best practices and for these governments to really understand what the basic uh, guidelines of international laws are when it comes to freedom of expression and human rights online. Thank you. Excellent report. Thank you, Sonia. Could you please hand the mic over to, to Jack? I th think you wanted also 
So, all right, the mic is gone. The mic is back. Great. Um, actually, I don't know if I'm reporting back or maybe I'll report back just on a section that relates to freedom of expression um, from oh, the workshop yeah. report, which is workshop uh, 171 on gender and internet governance roundtable. Okay. Um, the thing that we discussed a lot is about the internet as a, as a kind of like a public space. So even as more women and dis- other uh, and discriminated and disadvantaged people enter into this space as a um, for um, to exercise their right to public participation, there are different kinds of strategies to limit this, including um, violence, including um, sorry, including um, uh, 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 sorry, sorry. Let me just backtrack because I'm trying to do too many things. Um, so just focusing on violence as a way to sort of um, uh, 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 limit pu- public participation public participation into this space, which is the internet. So how does this violent, this forms of violence look like? Um, I think earlier there was uh, discussion around harassment, around extortion, around privacy violation and responses to that, which is self-censorship, which can also be a form of harm, um, which is then in turn uh, limited an impact to uh, a woman's right to freedom of expression as well. So that's from the workshop. This is my own comment, which is around um, limitations to... Um, legitimate limitations to freedom of expression, which was a question that was raised earlier. What is a legitimate limitation? And one of the legitimate limitations um, is um, public morality. And I think this is what actually provides um, states with the legitimacy to enter into this sphere of regulating online content because it is the state's duty to regulate public morality. But public morality is one of these things which is very vague um, and it's very unclear. And once you put this on the table... Um, you realize that there's a lot of things that can enter into the conversation. And the, the people who are most impacted by legislation and by measures which regulate expression and information online on the basis of public morality are those who are already disadvantaged in society anyway. So who am I talking about? I'm talking about women, I'm talking about young people, I'm talking about those who are sexually diverse. So I'll give you some examples. Um, for example, on women's bodies, Google Ads don't allow for advertisements on abortion, um, whether or not it is legal in a country. For example, in Malaysia, abortion is not illegal, but advertisements, Google, advertisements on abortion is not allowed on Google Ads. Um, and in Indonesia itself, LGBT sites are being blocked uh, under the Anti-Pornography Act. So one of the sites that has recently been blocked is the site called Our Voice, which is a site for LGBT communities to exercise their voice, to, you know, to participate in public association and, uh, and assembly. And I think I'll stop there. Just, just Thanks very much. You'll get another chance if you want to later on. Uh, let's turn to Joy. A few words on, on uh, the workshop that, that you did. And, uh, yeah. Thank you. I just wanted to report back from, from two workshops, actually. One was workshop 134, Connecting Our, our Rights, Strategies and uh, for Progress, and also um, Workshop 99, Charting the Charter on Internet Rights and Principles Online. Um, and to pick up a couple of points um, that haven't been raised yet, one is that um, not only are these issues uh, impacting uh, in relation to litigation and governments, as has been mentioned, but that also they're raising issues for national human rights institutions um, for example, we've had the chair of the Indonesian Human Rights Commission, Komnas Ham, here at this um, IGF, and I believe that's the highest ranking national institution's representative that's ever been at, a, at an IGF, um, uh, trying to understand how these issues impact on the mandate they have and how they respond to freedom of expression issues uh, in their context. So, uh, and also how they can support um, taking up these issues at the global level, for example, in the uh, United Nations Human Rights Council. So I think that's an important um, an aspect to take into account. The, the other thing was to, to note that uh, while there was a discussion about principles and, um, and these new necessary and proportionate principles uh, that were referred to earlier, these are very much seen as as, as guidance for how to apply existing standards rather than the creation of new standards um, and that particularly as governments are considering new legislation more than they have before that these are the things that the internet community can offer and particularly the internet governance community can offer to um, human rights defenders and make links um, in terms of how to apply existing standards to these issues online. So I just wanted to add those other two, two points. 
Thank you very much. We have now uh, Brett Solomon, who's going to report back on one, and then we have Gree, and uh, and we'll take a few comments. Brett, please. Uh, yeah. So um, there was a session the day before yesterday on, on telecoms and network shutdown. Um, <clears throat> and I think in the context of surveillance, people aren't spending much time thinking about that issue. Um, we actually looked at a number of different case studies, the most recent of which was in September um, 25th and 26th in Sudan. Uh, four telcos uh, shut down um, the internet during a series of protests in Khartoum, uh, and we looked at the human rights implications of that particular shutdown. Uh, we had uh, a representative from the Industry Dialogue, uh, which is the ten of, t- 10 of the world's largest telcos who have set out uh, put out a series of guiding principles, um, and we actually had a really interesting discussion and came to the conclusion that there is never a justification for a internet shutdown, including from the industry dialogue, civil society, uh, and and um, and government. So it was great. It was actually very very good, and it was also good to see that kind of norm development happening here at the IGF. Good. Congratulations. Now, Gri, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, I'm Kui Hasebald Lapenta from the Danish uh, Media Council for Children and Young People and the European InSafe Network. Um, our workshop was number 308 on privacy and innovation, and I'm more than giving a report, I'm going to give a comment on uh, the results from this workshop, or in general, the whole point of having a workshop like this. Uh, in the sense that privacy and innovation in many business and governmental discussions, policy making discussions, tend to collide. Uh, but for the sake of innovation, I will suggest that we urgently need real invest, investments, and I'm going to come back to what I mean with that, in privacy and in these free spaces where creativity and free innovation actually can thrive. Um, and of course, uh, the reason why we held this workshop is that you, you can actually see it as a societal in, investment that is not just for the benefit of the individual c- citizen, but also for society as a whole. So rather than seeing privacy as an obstacle to innovation, it should be seen as a basis for uh, innovation and an area of opportunity. So this is what we did with the workshop. Um, We had five young people there, and the reason we had these were to present what they're actually asking for when they're asking for control. Uh, Users are in general increasingly asking for transparency and control of the context uh, of their interactions online. They ask to trust, and we've heard this a lot today, uh, to, have, to trust the services they use, to have a choice in their interactions. And uh, as I, we also heard today in the w- workshop, there is a rise of privacy, consumer advocacy movements. One of our panelists calls it uh, green movements, as one panelist said. Um, so these needs to be, of course, this need for control uh, of context needs to be addressed and included in business development and policy making. So it's clear from today's discussion also in this panel is that trust, it's been shaken tremendously um, and I can only repeat uh, what has been said before is that it needs to be rebuilt and these strategies to rebuild trust includes new innovative technological privacy solutions, uh, also a different business model and innovation in privacy regulations and policy making. Uh, So this means a new way of addressing privacy as an area worth investing in, and I mean this very concretely, not just addressing it as a green movement idiosyncrasy. Um, So there's presently a a huge imbalance in the investments uh, in innovation in surveillance technologies and innovations in big data compared to what society as a whole actually invests in innovating in privacy, and this means new technologies, policies, policies that can actually respond to a digital environment. And this weight balance actually needs to be tipped on all accounts. Uh, Because presently, as it looks, uh, the the control that users are asking for, and I'm asking, I'm actually basing this on my nine years of working with young people, um, um, they're increasingly asking for control and to trust the services they use, but this is not addressed adequately and uh, trust is diminishing, as we've seen. So we need to invest in privacy innovation to safeguard innovation in general. So this was the whole point of the workshop. 
Thank you. Do we have any other workshops on freedom of expression that like to, to say a few words at this point? Otherwise, I'm going to draw the line here, actually, and go on. Moez, ask for the floor. Thank you. I would just uh, want to highlight the Open Forum on Freedom Online Coalition. We had this, uh, uh, this morning Freedom Online Coalition for, for Open Forum, and it was really... Uh, Uh, the microphone, mic I'm closer sorry. to them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I want to highlight the Freedom Online Coalition open forum that we held this morning, and it's very important to highlight because it's also an open forum for all of us, including the government and the multi-stakeholder and the civil society and all the private sector to, to, to be present and to highlight how it's important to keep the debate with those issues. That's it. And, of course, there will be a meeting in Estonia, so the next conference will be the 27th and 28th of April. We have one more here. Okay. The mic is on its way. Thank you. I'm Zara Dean from the Developing Country Center for Cybercrime in Pakistan. And I'd just like to mention regarding proliferation of legislation, which many um, participants have talked about. That's helpful and that's a good thing. As long as legislation is modeled in line with best practices, especially with regard to surveillance in the criminal justice sphere, as long as the best practices are open platforms and harmonize law and provide minimum standards and a baseline, this will allow consistency and will allow work and cooperation with other countries across the globe. Considering that the Internet is borderless, this is very important. So proliferation of legislation is not a negative thing, as long as harmonization also occurs. Additionally, legislation should also ensure that mechanisms for those who sell technology which promote human rights violations should be banned and should be locked down. Thank you. Right. Do we have any more workshops on free expression issues that would like to say something now? No. In that case, we're running a little bit behind schedule now, so I'm eager to continue, actually. Marianne, do you want it now? or? Sorry? Great. We, we haven't forgotten you. I think you're in part three as well. All right. Okay. All right. So um, we'll, we'll continue, I think, and um, try to find space for everyone to speak. Anya, please continue. Thank you, Johan. Um, the third block of uh, the issue-based sections today will basically look at openness on the Internet and its relation to freedom of expression. And openness, of course, has many different aspects to it. Um, the first one, and I'll ask uh, Claudio Ruiz from Derechos Digitales in Santiago a question about that first, are a whole bunch of issues that have to do with free flow of information, access to knowledge, and intellectual property rights. A few years ago, suddenly we had a lot of attention for these issues when in the U.S. the whole campaign against SOPA, PIPA, and ACTA came up to speed and then that campaign also spread to Europe. Uh, but as in developing countries, both before and after that, these issues uh, have always been a concern. So Claudio, what do you think? Where are we today on this topic? Can somebody get a mic to Claudio? Thank you. Uh, I was supposed to be censored, maybe, but okay. Um, well, thank you uh, very much, Anya. Um, I, I would like to, to highlight a couple of ideas uh, related with uh, the access to knowledge uh, movement, and especially about the relationship between copyright and um, freedom of expression at the end, especially when we're um, talking about digi the digital realm. Um, when Eduardo uh, say, it says at the beginning what were the, the, the threats that uh, are, have been facing into the region, in Latin America, uh, I will uh, add and complement uh, the, the, the case of copyright. Uh, we have a, co a couple of uh, very bad examples on the, into the region uh, that I really wanted to highlight. And, and the cases of Argentina and Brazil, for instance, are quite interesting. 
in the way that these two very important countries into the region uh, doesn't have any uh, special provision over libraries, for instance, uh, in related with uh, copyright. So they're in the, sh in the hall of shame, if we wanted to put it in that word, uh, of the copyright situation when we're talking about balance and when we're talking about access to knowledge uh, in general. And there's another issue that I think is important and which is strongly related to what we're talking about uh, now. It's about uh, what is it, the situation of Latin America when we're talking about international copyright regulation. And uh, in this matter, I would like to, to, to say two things. The first one is uh, that Latin America has been facing in the last years a very strong uh, push, uh, especially from the United States, over to have a more strict or strong uh, copyright provisions. And uh, this, is, this is especially related uh, to the sign of the FTAs, of the free trade agreements, uh, which are uh, somehow driving the uh, internal agenda over copyright issues. And sadly, uh, all, the, all the, uh, the stakeholders which are related with the discussion, even in, in the national uh, the situation or in, or in the regional uh, 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 situation, are not civil society organizations, are, are just private, and there's uh, groups uh, coming from the United States which are not uh, necessarily uh, related with or concerned about the freedom of expression issues, uh, neither the access to knowledge. So I think the second, the second thing that I wanted to highlight is related with this and, uh, and how Latin America has become, on some part, for some, uh, for some commenters, uh, the piracy paradise, on some part. Um, so this has, uh, has pushed a lot of important agenda over a more restrictive copyright regulation. Uh, the, 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 uh, the discussion over the TPP right now, for instance, has been a very important thing over the region because it's Chile, it's Mexico, and Peru, the three countries, in the, three very important countries in, in the region, which are nowadays part of the negotiations of, of, of a treaty which First of all, uh, nobody knows exactly what is the specific uh, issues that they've been cons uh, discussed because it's, it's secret. And secondly, because the only information that we have is about the leaks of the United States uh, proposal of, over this in February of 2011. And there's a very, very sad news when, we, uh, when we're uh, seeing that, that information uh, closely. So I think it's important... Uh, to highlight the state's position over this, which is quite different when we're talking about the, uh, the, the Internet freedom agenda that the states has, which is a, a whole different story when you're comparing with the USDR. So I think there's a very important and very critical point there, which I think the states need to highlight. And uh, when, I, when, uh, when we're talking about developing countries like Chile and developing countries within the region, I think it's a very important thing and a very important and a huge elephant that is in the room, and we, we can't uh, leave that like there. Um, thank you, Claudio. I do think that this is a concern for many civil society activists, at least. Um, I wanted to call ne next on uh, Nick Ashton Hart, who I know wears several hats, but I think today is uh, representing the International, uh, International Digital Economy Alliance. And Nick, part of the reason I want to call on you next is because I'm wondering if you can so some controversy here and whether you will disagree with Claudio or agree. Um, well, I, I don't know how controversial it would be. Um, I, I think that we, we see increasingly um, content as the enemy. You'll have to speak a little louder, sorry. I think we increasingly see a sort of uh, scapegoating of content. Um, and and um, that, that there's an increasing use of, of tools to remove material that relates to other public policy priorities, whether it's IP or speech or the like, and that the techniques that are used are increasingly um, disruptive uh, in aggregate to the Internet in general, which... You know, I, I think we have a shared interest that the Internet provides the best service for the largest number of people at the least cost. And the more there is a perception that, um, that there is risk in providing access to material or 
that certain countries may or may not allow material to transit their country or that the domain name system or the parts of the naming system would be used to prevent access to material. Um, it, it makes the Internet, um, it, 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 it's disruptive at a, at a fairly fundamental level. And um, I think there's a, my, my experience in Geneva is certainly that there's really not much understanding amongst policymakers, uh, either the ones who visit Geneva or the ones uh, who are based there, on how the Internet works and what the choices that are made relating to content that sound easy and convenient um, to accomplish a, a, a near-term end actually mean in the longer term. Uh, the death of a thousand cuts is a phrase that gets used uh, in this sort of thing. And so I, I, um, I think we, we all have a job to do to explain better to policymakers why the Internet works well, the miracle that it is, the ability to add on almost endlessly to its edges without asking anyone's permission, but that that, really, that, that miracle really depends on restraint and, and on ensuring that acts which are taken for, for public policy reasons inside a country um, are not taken in such a way that it undermines the, the overall network and its ability to provide the most service, especially given that we're, we're only 40% of the way to connecting everyone. Um, so I, I think that's, that's my sort of overall concern, is there seem to be more and more reasons to, to interfere with what people can see, find, um, say, uh, and a lack of awareness of the impacts of of continuing down that path. Thank you, Nick. Not controversial, but very useful contribution nevertheless. Thank you for that. Um, I next want to turn to Stuart Hamilton for, from the International Federation of Library Association. Um, Stuart, why, uh, what is the benefit of open access online to scientific knowledge in particular? Is that something we require, and if so, why? Um, well, I think in my intervention I'm going to concentrate just a little bit on, on sort of the IP problems that we're facing, but when it comes to open access to scientific knowledge, we're very much in favour of that, um, and I think that it will become to be recognised as, uh, as, a, as a right of people to be able to access information that they've paid for through their tax dollars, for example. But when we talk about libraries, I think it's important to remember that every day hundreds of millions of people use public, academic, research, school and national libraries to access their information. So we're talking about um, a very large number of people here who can be affected by the frameworks which have been discussed by the two previous speakers. For us, um, and consequently for our users, we are suffering the effects of the unbalanced copyright frameworks that have just been described. Um, what's happened is that they haven't really been updated for the digital age in a way that enables libraries to do their jobs. The sort of fundamental things that we do, preservation of cultural heritage and making that available, um, access to, to journal articles and being able to transfer them between libraries to remote and rural areas, for example, um, even lending of materials. Um, the digital age, uh, the copyright frameworks we have now just isn't letting us do that. Instead, we're being pushed more and more into a licensing system which imposes restrictions on what we can do with our material. It imposes restrictions on what our users can do with the material in terms of maybe not being able to print it, maybe not being able to quote from it, um, maybe having to come a very long distance into the library to get it, which kind of defeats the purpose of the Internet somewhat. Um, and that's doubled sometimes with digital rights management, which really locks up what we can do. So the consequences of that are not only that librarians can't do their jobs, but in more and more cases, we can't choose the information that our community wants based on their needs. Uh, and in fact, the choices about what we get are being sort of are coming from publishers, large rights holders. Lots of things are bundled up. Uh, we get some, shall we say, less quality journals bundled with good ones. And the end consequence of this really is going to be that information is available. The information available is what we can afford to pay for. Um, and of course, that's going to be 
great if you're in the U.S. in a nice university library where you've got a lot of money, but perhaps less effective if you're in Malawi in the university there. Um, so to sum up, if we don't get an updated copyright framework that benefits libraries and archives to enable us to do our jobs, it's the users that are going to suffer. Um, I'm pleased to say that we're working on that at WIPO on International Copyright Treaty for Exceptions and Limitations. But at the moment, these issues perhaps are not very much in the foreground, but I think we'll all notice in 20 or 30 years' time when your cultural heritage material from your own countries, which you think should be digitally available online, just isn't there. Thank you very much, Stuart. I think we had three very strong perspectives here that kind of highlight the very uh, high cost, actually, that current copyright regimes have for access to information. Uh, Pranesh, I want to talk, turn to you now, Pranesh Pakash from the Center for Internet and Society. Why, if we turn it around and look at it from the other side, then why is openness important and how can openness actually support our rights? What will it do for that? Thank you, Anya. Uh, the Internet is seen as a global public good. It's seen as a public space. But does it, uh, is it currently structured to support that. Uh, right now, uh, we are living in a world of private laws of contracts, uh, private property and technological enforcement rather than public law. Uh, digital rights management and technological protection measures, which Stuart touched upon, uh, which are now being baked into HTML5, ensure that private enforcement through technologies which do not respect the exceptions contained in copyright laws around the world become the norm. Uh, in India, for instance, we have wide-ranging exceptions for educational uh, materials, uh, wide-ranging exceptions in copyright law for educational materials, but the DRMs that are being baked into the web right now won't allow for them to be used. Uh, we are right now in danger of turning the open World Wide Web into walled copyright gardens. We need law to ensure that technologies and contracts cannot override protections provided by the law. And this is something that the, techn uh, that the technology community, uh, which is, uh, which is uh, currently making the standard, such as HTML5, have to realize. Another problem, for instance, domain name seizures for copyright reasons, which happened in the US, show that there is a fundamental misuse of the DNS system that currently there is no place to address. The Internet Governance Forum should be that place. Yet, this year, there were no sessions that actually addressed this issue. Access to knowledge issues were kept to a minimum at the IGF, and I'd like to know why. It's too, the current, many laws around the world make it too easy to have accusations of copyright infringement to remove legitimate content. The largest number of websites blocked in India is not because of national security reasons or for communal harmony. It is for copyright reasons. And the problem is that for some reason copyright is not seen as a free speech issue. So the standards of protection in terms of making sure that the other party is represented in court cases, etc., are greatly diminished when it comes to copyright uh, related issues. And complaints are seen as, as enough to uh, make uh, accusations real. So uh, what, what happened in India was one general order was gotten from a court under which general order lots of legitimate websites which did not host copyrighted content were blocked. It, had to, it took a long while for the court to actually realize that the order was being misused. But uh, these kinds of misuse of the legal process is still continuing. When you're talking about free flow of information, I'd like to bring uh, to light the, the case of uh, a friend and a person I respected a great lot, Aaron Schwartz, who committed suicide uh, earlier this year because of a witch hunt that was launched, launched against him and a prosecution launched against him for downloading too much from JSTOR. Now, he had legal access to this website, but he just downloaded too many uh, articles from this website and that was the cause for, for uh, the witch hunt that was launched against him. Denial of service attacks uh, launched by, by some activists, okay, people who are using uh, the online medium for protest, 
uh, often get sentences of multiple years, whereas people picketing on, on private property or trespass don't. People who, are, uh, who were involved in the London riots, for instance, and were protesting, they don't get multiple years as sentences. They're still able to engage in political protest and, and not spend years behind jail, whereas political protesters of today aren't able to do so. And there's a great problem in this. Uh, we know, uh, so non-proprietary, free, liberal open source software is needed to prevent opaque backdoors and trojans that are present in proprietary software that al allow for surveillance and prevent the free exercise of speech. Uh, and uh, just a couple points more. Uh, public domain material have no part in the discussion of internet governance anymore, whereas at one point there was a proposal to have a separate GTLD for public domain materials, which unfortunately didn't get any traction. And the one good thing at the end of this, this dark, dark tunnel is that uh, now cross-border exchange of accessible books, books that are uh, copyrighted but are accessible for persons with, who are blind, is uh, becoming possible thanks to a new uh, UN treaty uh, that was concluded in Marrakesh earlier this year. And that's pretty much the only good trend that I, that I notice. Thanks. Thank you, Panesh, for that passionate plea. If I can just add a small point myself, I think we also increasingly in developing countries see the impact of these internet-related copyright policies or treatment of copyright uh, offline. For example, in Delhi University, there is a tiny uh, little photocopy shop that has been sued by three big academic publishers for millions for preparing course packs for students that just have extracts of books, not whole books. And I think this is something that we would never have seen 10 years ago. It's really an outcome of how uh, the enforcement of copyright uh, becomes stricter and stricter and is pushed through more harshly all the time. So I think the effects are much broader than just about the Internet. Um, there are other important issues, of course, related to openness. Perhaps before we continue, though, is there another comment from the floor? I think we should be able to take one in between, if there are any. Yes, the gentleman over there. Hi, uh, my name is uh, Chris Wilson. I'm uh, from the United States. I work for actually one of the world's major media companies, uh, Time Warner. Uh, and so I thought I was just simply going to hear, to observe today's discussion, but obviously a lot's been said about uh, openness and copyright. Um, I won't belabor some of these points that have been made. I will simply suggest that uh, I believe the argument that copyright protections and uh, openness and freedom of speech, uh, et cetera, or at uh, opposite purposes, uh, I think is a false, a false dichotomy, quite frankly. Uh, to be sure, uh, there are abuses that occur, uh, and I won't speak to certain countries. I'm not privy to what goes on in India on a daily basis. Uh, but I can certainly suggest that I believe, uh, I know Time Warner and a variety of other major companies that produce some of the world's highest quality content out there, uh, including you know, something like CNN that, that is out there, you know, reporting on what takes place across the world, uh, believes in the freedom of speech, uh, believes in free expression, um, and uh, is not at cross purposes with that. So I just wanted to look for that out there, that there are other points of view uh, on, that, on that work, and there's certainly work to be done um, with, with uh, those that, uh, in, my, in my, my line of work, uh, and those in your line of work, um, and forums like today are important discussions, and I think hopefully they'll continue, continue in, in further IGFs and other, other venues. But simply wanted to say that we are, we are not at cross purposes, that we're all intents and purposes. We actually believe strongly in the same, in the same beliefs and freedoms. Um, and sometimes it might come down to implementations, but uh, at, at its heart we are, we are on the same, same playing field. So thank you. Um, thank you for that note. I think uh, Claudio has a quick response. Of course. Uh, the fact that there's a lot of child, uh, regu child, um, child pornography regulation that we are against, that doesn't mean that we are uh, in favor of child uh, pornography. And, and the, same, the same thing happened with the, with the copyright. Uh, the, the, the realm of the fundamental rights are obvious all the time in tension. There's always a tension between freedom of expression and privacy. There's always a tension between a lot of human rights. The human rights are not something which is we can see actually on the table, are always intentionally movement. 
And um, so therefore, uh, the fact that, that we are facing here a lot of issues, and serious issues, as Pernich has uh, as said recently, around freedom of expression and copyright, that doesn't mean that uh, the companies like Time Warner or others or Disney or whatever uh, doesn't support uh, freedom of expression. The point is the, uh, the policies that they have been driving and the policies that have been driving internally in the States and externally via the USDR are actually damaging freedom of expression, are damaging public domain, and are damaging Internet at the end. Thank you, Claudio. We'll move on for now. I'm sure we won't settle the debate here today, but I think uh, these were very valuable contributions. I just wanted to point out also behind us on, or behind me on the screen and in front of you uh, are a number of questions that were collected through the public consultation process that was done in the IGF. I'm not sure if we'll be able to uh, address all of them, but I wanted to turn to uh, Luca Belli from uh, the Dynamic Coalition on Network Neutrality. And perhaps Luca asked about question number four, which says what enablers need to be recognized by all policymakers to support the free flow of information on the Internet globally, regionally, and locally? Is network neutrality such an enabler, and why, how does that work? Yes, thank you. Uh, I would also precise that I'm currently serving as a network neutrality expert for the Council of Europe, so I have several hats. Uh, and that I work at Sarsa, uh, Sorbonne University in Paris. I would like to report uh, briefly on the workshop on uh, natural neutrality from architecture to norms that we had yesterday that deals explicitly with this topic. Uh, also, I would like to report on this because we uh, managed to reach some rough consensus of some topic on natural neutrality, which is quite difficult. Uh, first of all, we agreed on the fact that uh, openness and neutrality are essential uh, features of the internet and they should, they have to be uh, fostered and ensured to uh, foster the free flow of information. Uh, we have agreed that uh, both openness and neutrality are the features that make the internet a key driver for innovation and also a great uh, human rights enabler and that enables also the free flow of information, uh, fosters creativity. And we have agreed also that uh, at present there are some traffic management techniques that can uh, uh, jeopardize this open and neutral uh, architecture and then can have uh, negative uh, effects on human rights. And so the, the second, the, this leads us to the second point uh, of rough consensus, that is uh, that uh, natural neutrality should not be taken should not be considered just from a competition law perspective, but also from a human rights perspective, because it is a human rights issue, it is a consumer rights issue, it is uh, uh, an issue that has obvious consequence on the uh, right to freely impart and receive information with, uh, within the Internet and through the Internet. It is an issue that as obvious uh, consequences on the capacity of end user to be an active participant of the internet and uh, share their information on the internet. And this leads us to the third point of agreement, that is that we uh, need to preserve uh, natural neutrality and to frame uh, uh, traffic management techniques according to human rights standard. So some regulatory tool is needed, not a random regulatory tool, but a good regulation, an evidence-based regulation, a regulation that fosters creativity, innovation, and human rights, and then fosters the free flow of information online. An a regulation that is efficient, and in order to elaborate this regulation, an open, transparent process should, should be adopted. And uh, this sort of process has been adopted to also to elaborate a model framework that, uh, wh whose elaboration has been initiated within, uh, thanks to the Council of Europe at the multi-stakeholder dialogue on uh, network and fighting human rights and has been develop developed by the Dynamic Coalition on Network and Friday that has transposed the IETF standardization process making to policy making to elaborate a standard on how to protect natural neutrality in an open and transparent fashion. Thank you.
Can you, thanks, sir, Luca. Can you maybe very briefly, 30 seconds, explain the basis of the model? Sorry? Can you very briefly explain the, basic, the basics of the model you're just referring to? Uh, the model will be presented tomorrow morning at the meeting of the Dynamic Coalition and then uh, will be communicated to the Committee of Ministers of the Council of Europe in December. So if you want, I can explain some basic points, but uh, I will ruin the surprise. Right, we don't want to do that. Um, perhaps let me turn then to uh, Paul Mitchell from Microsoft US. Uh, if somebody can get the microphone to Paul, thank you. Uh, Paul, what Luca mentioned was uh, we need traffic management tools that protect human rights, network neutrality is crucial in that sense. Can we solve that with national frameworks or do we need global frameworks for these kind of issues? Uh, well, first let me say I have very little to disagree with what, what uh, he just said as far as um, overall network neutrality issues, but I would divide them into two categories. Uh, the first is the social or political uh, net neutrality issues, and the second is commercial. And I think the fix is different between the two. Um, in both cases, you ultimately will have a technical fix, and I'll, I'll get to answering your specific question in a minute. But in both cases, you'll have a specific technical fix around defining what types of traffic management tools can be used. But in the commercial case, you are really talking about how an entity chooses to advantage itself versus the consumers or its competition, and that is a competition law issue. In the former, you're talking about social engineering, restriction of of uh, freedom of expression, restriction of access to content, providing economic harm to citizens, depriving them of access to education, to information, and to global discourse. And unfortunately, the fixes to that are not technical. Uh, most of those fixes are in the political realm. And that it's therefore incumbent upon the companies and the entities that operate the global infrastructure to effectively act in the interests of the broader human rights uh, objectives and interests of society. Uh, and so when you have um, a net, neutral net neutrality issues writ large, the principles really need to be widely touted and widely embraced and widely communicated by all of the actors involved. And increasingly that's happening, uh, at least in the developed Western world not so much in other parts of the world, but hopefully it can be have a spillover effect. Your question was, can this be handled from uh, a local perspective or does is, can it be handled globally or, or locally? And I think the answer really is both. It takes a global, uh, global pressure and a global idea in order to address the political and the social side. Uh, but on the actual implementation on the ground, it is going to take local regulation and local implementation of networks, of traffic management systems, and of monitoring systems to enable compliance. Um, and I'll stop there. Thank you, Paul. I can see your, uh, uh, the argumentation of splitting the social political aspects on the one hand and the competition aspects on the other hand from the perspective of businesses. But of course in this session I can't help but wonder uh, whether that would have uh, a negative impact on freedom of expression nevertheless. Uh, Luca, you had a comment? Yeah, just a quick reply. Maybe I wasn't speaking my mind clearly. Uh, it, is, it has also competition law aspects. The, what I was saying, it is fundamentally wrong to think that it has only competition law. So I, I, we agree on this. We have reached draft consensus. But is there no free speech concern in actually splitting the, com the competition law aspects from the social and The issue is aspects? that openness and neutral, let's say non-discriminatory traffic management at the same time facilitates freedom of expression and freedom of innovation. When you facilitate freedom of innovation, you let end user participate to the internet and share their creativity. The best innovation, the, the best disruptive innovation in the, on the internet were, be, were produced by end users that one day share their innovation for free on the internet and then it went viral. 
Yeah, thanks for clarifying that. I guess sometimes what users are concerned about is that the competition law aspects are used to actually throttle in various ways content online, uh, in ways that business might argue don't affect free freedom of expression, but users awfully argue that they do. So that was the point I was trying to get. Um, in any case, if you are interested, we have developed all, not all, but several uh, human rights related uh, aspects of national neutrality in the report of the Dynamic Coalition on National Neutrality that will also be discussed tomorrow morning at the meeting. Nine o'clock or? At nine o'clock. This is your moment. Nine o'clock, the Network Neutrality Dynamic Coalition meeting promises to be very interesting. Highly recommended. Um, I would like to move next to uh, Malcolm Hutty. Malcolm, you'll have to help me. Links. He represents links, but I must admit I'm not fully sure what the abbreviation stands for from London. Um, I wanted to come to you about intermediary liability. There is a question about that on the list as well, which is very general in terms of what's the effect on freedom of expression. But I think we actually had quite a lot of attention for this over the past few years for a while, and slowly it seems to have uh, moved more to the background of the agenda. Does that mean we've actually made progress on intermediary liability? We don't have to be as concerned anymore? Well, let me see if I can bring it back up the agenda for you then, because I think it's actually key. Um, I work with links. My microphone. Name is Malcolm Hutty. I am the... Um, can you keep the microphone a bit closer? I'm sorry. My name is Malcolm Hutty, and I'm at the links to London Internet Exchange. I'm also the president of EuroISPA, the European Internet Service Providers Association, and the chairman of its intermediary liability committee. Um, so our, the companies that I represent, they're companies. And sometimes they are challenged by this community for um, not doing more to stand up for human rights. Um, some of those companies do quite a lot, actually, I think. Um, some have the particular legal skills, legal advocacy skills and resources to do so. Smaller companies are particularly vulnerable. But I would like to suggest to this community that companies in some ways are even more vulnerable than a journalist or a campaigner or, or an individual can be um, when it comes to freedom of expression violations. Um, sometimes those who might otherwise seek to infringe human rights and freedom of expression would forbear because they don't want to make the campaigner um, some sort of celebrity. Companies don't generally have the kind of sympathy, the public sympathy, that is needed to make that happen, and so the forbearance doesn't exist in that case. When the penalty might be a financial penalty, we know that the company has money which individuals often don't. So there's a good reason to go after the company then as well. When it comes to questions of defamation, the person who is saying something knows why he's saying it. He might knows that it's true. The company that is an intermediary doesn't necessarily know that the defamation um, complaint isn't justified. And when it comes to offensive and unpopular speech that is otherwise you know, a legitimate part of discourse, the company may not agree with it. The company may not like it. So it's, they become quite vulnerable to a uh, uh, complaint that says, do you really want to be complicit with this? So I would contend that intermediary liability protection is vital if users are going to actually enjoy the human rights and freedom of expression that they've been granted in theory. Now, European law provides um, some quite good protections, but it's not, not complete. And in the United Kingdom, we see a clear correlation between those areas where it is weakest and where the behavior is most um, challengeable, most um, uh, potent potentially problematic. So, for example, the European law does, um, protects intermediaries against um, financial liability in, some, in most cases, but does not protect them against being instructed to block access to material. And so we see in the United Kingdom blocking orders being given and often being given by judges when things is being blocked has not had judicial examination as to whether or not it is actually a violation but it's claimed, oh, well, it's a copyright violation. We haven't looked at whether it is, but we know that we block copyright infringing sites, so we'll do that. Um, we, uh, it's not clear that um, internet domain registries have the protection that hosting providers have, and so we've seen our national domain registry has been required um, by the police to suspend domain names. It's been threatened that if it doesn't do so, then it will have liability for the definitely in, uh, uh, illegal material uh, that is being published, if the police allegation is correct, but in circumstances where it has never been justified in court. So, given that we see this correlation, I would like to suggest to you, as a closing remark, 
um, that as we come to the um, looking at the principles that we um, establish, that we may well be establishing on a global level over the next months and years, is it really best to be focusing on general but qualified principles of freedom of expression, which already exist in a general context? And if we establish them again for the Internet, we risk further, further qualifying. Or might it be more effective to ensure that users have the practical opportunity to enjoy the rights that they already have by establishing the strongest protections we, uh, that are achievable for the intermediaries on which they rely to exercise those rights? Thank you. Um, thank you, Malcolm. We are unfortunately fast running out of time. I had two more people on my list who we would very briefly like to give the floor. Um, and then if there's some very urgent closing remarks anybody else wants to make, we will try and fit those in, but that might not be possible. So I'm giving you advance warning. But Sahit, we might have to cut, cut you a little bit short. If you can just two minutes. Uh, one minute. Okay. Well, let me start by saying I'm going to describe a situation that had a, a local situation in Pakistan that had, and has an international connection, so it might take a little more than a minute. Um, th th there, is, there, was, there was a question about intermediary liability legislation in Pakistan. You know about the situation where Facebook and YouTube had been taken down. Uh, this is something that a lot of people have talked about. But this led to criminal cases in court. The high courts and others started criminal cases where what is interesting to, to note here the person who put up the content wasn't the, the, the target of this. It were the businesses and the platforms and the service providers who became the employees, who became the target of these sort of actions. First of all, good on them not to cow down, number one. That was business. Number two, what did that result in? It? Well, somebody went to court and said, well, let's try and see if we can sort this out. The court instead turned around and said, let's try and look into intermediary liability law. And it started affecting a cybercrime legislation that we have in Pakistan where we had a pretty decent intermediary liability protection clause already built in. And suddenly they come in with this ITU. And this is where I want to talk about irresponsibility probably at the international level, the collision that we had. An ITU model law called HIPCAR. I don't know how many people actually have heard of this model legislation. I heard the Budapest Convention. I hear other things. But I don't know if anybody's heard about these three model laws. There are number one, one of, there are three of them, one for the Caribbean, one for the Pacific, and one for the Sub-Saharan region. It's interesting to see what it does, and I'm going to link it with intimidated liability. It says that religious crimes are cyber crimes. Blasphemy is a cyber crime. This is an ITU model law. After having said that, it goes on to start defining certain very interesting items such as, well, um, search engine providers is a definition. I don't know. It, it's interesting. Then there's a definition of hosting provider, access providers, cacheing providers. Goodness, my laptop is it. And hyperlink providers. And what it says about those different providers is that basically liability, starts with liability, and says, well, you're not liable, etc., et only if it's criminal. So it only gives you criminal protection. But all that is gone if there's a court order. Sorry. No criteria, no list of what actually has to be done to prove that basically you were liable. Just if there's a court order, suddenly you're liable. That's the kind of international best practice that is being sent down to national countries. We had to fight it on the ground. The draft came to us and we were like, no, our clause is much better. What's going on here? No, this is an international provision. It's from the ITU. These three model laws are fantastic. We must implement them. And it actually sort of started becoming aggressive practice. I'm, I'm glad to tell you that's not what we did. We did not follow the ITU model laws on that. But I just wanted to give you an example. One, look at what business it stood by, what it, uh, the principles we're all talking about, freedom of expression. It, international engagement, which is going so terribly wrong. Yes, I'll it. stop. One other last, last point. Guess who funded that ITU model law process? The European Union. The question is, is it a violation of ECHR? Maybe to promote blasphemy and those sort of religious acts as cyber crimes? Question. Thank you. Thank you. That's a, a very poignant question. Um, I'm very sorry to all the people, we are all very sorry to all the people who didn't get to speak, but Gbenka, I want to give you very briefly the final remarks before we turn to our rapporteur to summarize the session. 
Over to Gubenga. Thank you. Earlier in the week, the Nigerian telecom regulator uh, had a full-page advert in, the Niger- in one of the leading Nigerian newspapers, actually more than one, and it basically said that anybody who uh, basically operates a cyber cafe in Nigeria at the moment has to, I mean, normally you're supposed to know your customers, right, but has to know their criminal, so know your criminal, KYC. And the idea is everybody who walks into a public cafe has to be registered before they can use the computers. And it's not just, you know, write your name and all that. Your name, your address, your identity card and all. And all this is mostly around the issue of intermediary liability. And so now, the, the irony, by the way, is the fact that most of the cyber cafes are dead anyway because of the cost of access or the cost of power supply. But this is an example of how the intermediary is liable and it has not just in terms of the freedom of expression but also economic you know, consequences as far as you know, the issues are concerned. I thought I should just raise that within one minute. Thank you. That's really appreciated the contribution, of course, as well, first of all. We're going to have two final, very brief one-minute interventions, one for Marianne Franklin from the Dynamic Coalition on Internet Rights and Principles, among many other heads, and one from Guy Berger. Marianne, why don't you go first? Yes, thank you. Um, There is only one minute remaining, so I will say one thing. Um, I'd like to endorse this and support it. I'm wholeheartedly to have a focus session on human rights. I think it's extremely important. And I would like to thank the organizers for pushing it and for advocating it for years. I think this is a real piece of progress. This is an output. Could we please acknowledge this as an output? Secondly, two other outputs, the Charter of Human Rights and Principles for the Internet that is embedded in the IGF multi-stakeholder process is out in um, hard copy old school form. And it stresses this is not a question of human rights or principles. It is a question of human rights and principles. They are delineated, they are distinct, but they are not inseparable. And the third point is this has been taken very seriously by the Council of Europe in their guide to existing rights of Internet users, which is being launched tomorrow. So we have the Charter of Internet of Human Rights and Principles for the Internet in concrete booklet form, old school still works, the guide from the Council of Europe, and we have this forum. And I hope we can extend our multi-stakeholder practice to have uh, sessions in which everybody can speak as freely as possible. I think we've done very well to keep this going this long. Thank you very much for allowing me finally to speak. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Marianne. And finally, Guy Berger. Thank you. I just wanted to bring to people's attention the post-2015 development agenda process. Uh, You may know that uh, Ban Ki-moon appointed a high-level panel to look at this question of what will replace the MDGs after 2015. Uh, the panel included the chair of Indonesia, amongst others. And actually, for the first time, really, freedom of expression has been recognized as part, a critical part of the development agenda uh, by this high-level panel. And so, for example, they say there that uh, the rule of law, freedom of speech in the media, etc., etc., help to drive development and have their own intrinsic value. They are both a means to an end and an, and an end in themselves. And they actually have a, a special goal, um, number 10, uh, which says people should enjoy freedom of speech. They elaborate that as saying that there should be vibrant, diverse, independent media. So uh, this is actually a very important uh, development, and it, it raises the possibility that the MDG uh, process and the WISIS review process may actually find some common ground and some intersection around freedom of expression. So uh, uh, this is by no means uh, final at this stage, but I think people should know if they're interested in freedom of expression issues and IGF and uh, on the internet, they are also uh, being paralleled in some ways uh, in this 2015 MDG review process. Thank you very much, Guy. Um, we have reached now, unfortunately, the end of, of the substantive session. And um, Joy, I will ask you kindly to wrap up. Um, and uh, please go ahead. You have five minutes. Thank you. Um, I thought I would wrap up by structuring the summary and reflections back to you uh, in relation to the policy questions that were asked uh, in this session and which I think have been um, uh, richly discussed. So, for example, the first one is what, what are and have been the main themes at the nexus of the Internet and human rights in the last year? And I think we've seen that there are a huge array of issues um, from every region 
uh, whether it's Latin America, Asia, the African region, Europe and Pacific, the complexity and depth of issues uh, is um, comprehensive. Um, and uh, the, some of the key primary uh, points have been in relation to privacy, mass surveillance, uh, free expression, blocking, filtering, network shutdowns. Um, so not only the range of um, forms of violations, but also those particular groups uh, who are affected, whether those are journalists, human rights defenders, women's human rights defenders, sexual rights activists, um, and so we're seeing a, a complexity that this isn't just a, an issue for only a narrow range of uh, those who are rights holders. Uh, and in terms of the, the main concerns um, and questions about um, what is working well to promote human rights and freedom of expression and what are the challenges, um, I think a number of you have mentioned, a number of speakers have talked about the um, enormous um, variety of ways in which governments have responded with legislation. Um, a huge variation in quality, uh, some referring to the Budapest Convention, for example, and correctly, others um, with no data protection laws, and we see a huge um, disparity uh, from, your, from your discussions in the types of regulation. Um, at the same time, uh, a number of you talked about the, the, the issues with how to strategise for new regulations where there hasn't been before. Um, uh, also in relation to um, the policy question on uh, whether access to the, in access to the internet is a, is a human right, we've seen, uh, for example, in Europe, new, new case law specifically referring to blocking of entire platforms being an interference with human rights. So new, new jurisprudence, new case law, new norms specifically focused on the internet uh, also, also emerging. Um, a number of um, uh, interventions have also pointed to this, this conflict between rights, um, whether it's uh, the conflict of uh, intellectual property and free expression or the rights of disabled users and access to content um, and the need for better understanding of how these rights can be balanced against each other. Uh, we've also had discussion of uh, how there are new tools emerging for for forms of violations we've never seen before, uh, mass surveillance has been mentioned in relation to, uh, to that in particular, and forefronting how, uh, as an internet governance community, that's responded to in a variety of, in a variety of ways. Uh, we've also had a, a high degree of, I think, of analysis in, of, of human rights issues, um, and whether it's in relation to uh, African region and uh, relating to infrastructure issues or whether it's in relation to Latin America, new forms of criminal defamation and so on. Um, I think the, 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 yeah, the strategies for, for responding to those also been, been under discussion with some depth. Um, in terms of the uh, um, the nexus, so this is the one of the other um, policy questions, was what is the nexus between fundamental rights and internet standards development? This, I think, also was a question that was uh, common. Uh, uh, sorry, a theme that was common in your discussions was how to connect openness in relation to internet standards with this desire for reasonable limitations online, uh, that limitations on rights are permissible and in fact they are necessary, but how does this relate to the openness standards and, and perhaps some leadership in new areas such as on network neutrality where there may be new ways in which techno, um, technical standards can be um, articulated to ensure human rights compliance, human rights by design if you like, in, in, um, in some of these issues. Um, I think those are possibly the main points that I had by way of, by way of summary. Thank, Thank you very much, Joy. In our planning, we had hoped that we would have about 20 minutes or half hour or so to discuss possible outcomes of this session, possible messages or advice from this session, um, as some kind of IGF conclusions or IGF advice to, to, um, uh, to the follow-up of, of this session. But unfortunately, we've run out of time. So I'd like to extend my, my uh, deep apologies to a handful of people who have prepared already, I'm sorry Lee, um, and others, you had prepared your advice. 
Can I please ask you to email them to us? And if you feel it's okay, also tweet them. So we'll see what happens. And to everyone, I think, in the room, if you have any ideas on how to bring this discussion on human rights further, in sort of in, in the IGF setting, um, or if the IGF could give any kind of advice to, I don't know, Human Rights Council maybe, or, or other places, on, on how to take this issue forward, please don't hesitate. Send them to us, and we'll try to, try to integrate them. Uh, thank you. You've been a very patient and a very qualified audience. Thank you so much for listening the entire afternoon. Uh, on behalf of uh, Carl and Joy and uh, Anya and Henriette and myself, thank you very much. Thank you to the remote uh, uh, moderators as well. It wasn't much from, from there. It wasn't much on Twitter either, but uh, they're probably busy doing other stuff. Uh, thank you very much for, for listening and participating. So, Mr. Chairman, uh, that will be conclude for me. May I butt in here and say, as a conclusion, can we conclude that we agree to continue the dialogue here? Yes. <laughs> and, and Mr. Chairman. Uh, HR session at every IGF, I hope. Yes. Well, uh, I believe we have had a very productive session this afternoon uh, on the discussion in the focus session of the openness, human rights, freedom of expression, and free flow of information on the Internet, uh, which we are discussing how to solve the problem in the real or cyber uh, problem, uh, including uh, around 50 uh, speakers, uh, interventions, and also report of the workshop, public consultation, also dynamic collision. If we discuss considering this openness, uh, never-ended uh, discussion, and we'll give innovations and also contribution, because everybody wants to get or to access information anywhere, anytime, and by anything, to leverage uh, their wealthiness, to speed up the reach of Millennium Development Goals uh, by way of multi-stakeholder cooperation or collaboration uh, utilizing the international or uh, national organization. Thank you. Uh, good evening.